Hello. Welcome to the webinar. I think the other uh, panelists are going to get their cameras and microphones on any moment. Um, but I have some housekeeping to do. So um, I'm going to read something because if I try and paraphrase it, it's not going to go well. So this is about uh, who is actually making these webinars possible. So here we go. The Entertainment Industry Professionals Mentoring Alliance, which I have been told is pronounced EATMA, is made up of 15 organizations who together are bringing you this webinar series to inform and educate on issues transforming our industry today. Although these subjects are very much on the professional level, we believe that for the students and non-professionals viewing this, that you will gain an understanding of the complexities facing all of us in this industry. And I think that's definitely true for tonight. Uh, we invite you to visit our member organizations' websites in the areas that interest you and become a member in these organizations whose hardworking members strive to improve and advance the entertainment industry today. At the end of the video that's posted on the EATMA YouTube channel, you'll find the member organizations' names and website addresses, and you can visit the Mentoring Alliance website at eipma.org for more information. And uh, this is a purely a volunteer group that is putting these things on. So if you feel like donating, that would be fantastic because that pays for doing stuff like this. Because with my rider, just paying someone to get the correct color M&Ms, that used up the entire budget for this webinar, as you know, you would expect. Okay, so really quickly, there are still three uh, webinars in this series. We did one a couple weeks ago, which was about more of the post-production mixing in Atmos and what's changed. It was actually really fascinating. There are a couple of things I'll probably bring up tonight. But uh, the next one is Mixing for Non-Theatrical Atmos that is hosted by Scott Gershon, and that is on 10 at the same time. Uh, and that's going to be Mixing for Immersive Sound for theatrical release of movies, but the change to non-theatrical, because that is a little bit more mature than Atmos for Music, but it is a pretty recent thing that has happened. Then the next one, uh, which is on the 22nd of the same month, is Sound Design, Preparing for a Non-Theatrical Atmos Mix, also hosted by Scott Gershon, who is one of the best sound designers I have ever met or seen, unbelievably creative, and has made his workflow work for Atmos. So that's gonna be an excellent panel. And then on November 5th uh, is the last one, which is translating to Atmos Recap. So that's going to summarize the stuff that happened in the previous four. Um, yes, so that's awesome. I'm now going to move that over to another screen. And if I glance to another screen, it's either because someone texted me to say I'm doing something wrong or I have to read something. If I turn completely away, that's because my cats have done something cute. All right. So this is the Atmos Mixing for Music seminar. And I'm going to go around in a circle from how I'm looking at people on the screen. If you could just briefly introduce yourself and then also give a quick synopsis of what you've been doing in Atmos for music. So uh, we will start with Richard Chicken, who is muted. Everybody there he hear goes. me OK? There we yes. are. We're unmuted. Richard Chicky here. Um, I've been a. Uh... I've been a mixer and engineer for uh, for an awful lot of years and been working in the, uh, I started in the uh, 5.1, I was in 5.1 surround for uh, for an awful long time and uh, moved into Atmos uh, a number of years ago, I started to focus on it heavily uh, once I'd heard the rumors that uh, Apple had put uh, Atmos into phones, but it wasn't uh, the hooks were there, but it wasn't released yet. So I, I knew it was really going to be a, uh, a big thing. So I've been working with uh, uh, Rush since 2004, uh, working on reissuing their catalog in immersive formats in 5.1 and now in Atmos. And my latest project is an animated uh, uh, feature film called Setna. So that'll be out right now, hmm, probably a few months out still. Does that film have anything to do with Rush? Because that would be awesome. No, <laughs> wouldn't okay. it? But it'd be like yet another thing of Rush. No, it's a, uh, it's actually an indigenous, uh, it's an indigenous theme, the animation for, uh, it's something that's, it's, it's quite a big deal up here in Canada. And it's, uh, it has to do with the uh, residential uh, school situation that's uh, been going on up here. So it's right. Awesome. And I was moving. 
I'm assuming that's your Atmos mix of Tom Sawyer that I have listened to and enjoyed quite a bit. Is that one? Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, yes, it would it's be. Awesome. There's, it's there's awesome. a couple out there. All right. I'm already taking way too much time. So, Anne, on to you. Would you like to tell us what's up? Oh, you're muted. Sorry about it's that. It's audio. I am <laughs> Ann Mincelli, uh, engineer for Alicia Keys the past 22 years and head um, head mixer and engineer. And I own Jungle City Studios in New York, partners in Sanctuary Studios in the Bahamas. Been working on the immersive committee with the Recording Academy for the past five years, which is how I wanted to develop the technology and understand it with Michael Romanowski and George Massenberg and Eric Schilling. Um, when we were tapped on the shoulder with this, you know, with from Dolby and um, the folks at Sony, we, um, we got quite a big deal from Sony and mixed in both formats. And I hired as a team together, myself, Eric, George and Mike to really work on eight albums in the immersive space. And then an unplugged album, which is more into the live space, the live album and Christmas album that we're working on. So we've done about 10 albums and um, worked through the twists and turns of all the technology and updates. You know, myself and George started at Black Blackbird mixing Alicia's singles for her new album at the time in 2018. So it's been uh, quite the journey and I want to continue developing the technology. Excellent, Steve. Hi everybody, um, Steve Jenelik. I am um, now formerly of Capital Studios. <laughs> I'm, uh, which is all wow, news, <laughs> news to me. <laughs> yeah, um, well, again, earthquake renovations. The studio will be back in all its glory. So um, that's, that's the deal with that. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm uh, now an independent engineer, which is great. Um, and I believe I'm responsible for a lot of this because I was the first one that had was tasked with uh, mixing a record in Dolby Atmos. Um, so that was like five or six years ago now. So I uh, can't tell you how many records and singles I've done. It's just been, it's been a whirlwind. It's been great. I'm having a blast with it. Um, ironically, in the last month, I haven't been doing that much of it. I've been in stereo world, which is kind of fun too. I like, you know, I like doing a lot of different stuff. So, um, but yeah, you know, it, it's, it's actually, it's been really fun. I'm, I'm really happy. I'm, I, I love the format. I love the technology. I love the fact that people are getting into it and, uh, you know, it's moving forward and yeah, it's great. Awesome. And last but not least, the Senator, Jimmy Douglas. I just always wanted to say it like that. Hey, um, Jimmy Douglas, um, mixer, producer, Atmos mixer. Um, yeah, and um, I, yeah, I've been doing like one one of the things I've been blessed with the task of is actually uh, going back and doing the Justin Timberlake catalog because I, I mixed I was I made I made a lot of those records. Um, the unfortunate part was there are no stems. The guy that did them didn't do any stems. I imagine that. You think he'd figure out in the future you're going to have Atmos and you need the stems, but. Um, <laughs> so I'm tasked with I'm doing his whole catalog, which is great, and a couple of other artists that I have done. Um, I'm I'm seeking out a lot of those catalogs. Not that I have to do it. I mean, especially if you have stems. If you get stems, pretty much anybody can. Well, not anybody, but it makes it easier to do this job. If you don't have stems, you kind of should know some of the thinking of the person that was doing and what they probably used. Um, and I'm also doing a lot of like uh, older funk records like people like people like uh, obscure obscure people like d train um some rick james stuff that's not obscure but uh some chaka khan stuff uh i'm falling find myself in this funk world and i'm and i'm actually loving it because it's where i grew from and it's a real it's a total point of comfort unfortunately most all of those don't have stems they're just all like you know it's almost like breaking out on the board i mean it's 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 laborious but uh here i am Excellent. Well, thank all you guys. Um, I'm Andrew Sheps. I've mixed some stuff. I've been doing some Atmos stuff. I'm surrounded by speakers. We'll get to all that. Um, you've already, just in the introductions, we brought up a lot of really interesting points that we will definitely get back to. But I think it might be good just to do a little bit of basic explaining. Maybe everyone could just talk about their setup. Like, what have you got? Not particular types of speakers necessarily, but what your speaker configuration is, how you check the binaural and the spatial and all that kind of stuff. Just equipment wise, 
what your setup is for spatial and does it share equipment with your stereo setup or is it just totally separate so we can just go back around the other way i'm gonna start with jimmy yeah um actually <laughs> believe it or not i thought i was the only one that did this i have separate a separate setup for my stereo versus the uh atmos um it's not it's not necessary now but in when i first started doing this there wasn't a lot of information written about how to set up and I spent like, it took me forever to figure out how to do this by myself. And once I got it, I noticed that when I went back to a stereo mix and opened the other guy that I lost everything I put together. So I was like, this isn't gonna work. So I, so from habit and just getting it done, I, there's a system for my Atmos and there's a system for my stereo. Um, and all it requires is me going back and changing the output of the stereo speaker to whether it goes to the Atmos or whether it goes to the stereo. But, um, now that I'm really doing it a lot, I'm like, it really wasn't that hard. And now there's a lot of information, there is a lot of information now available online and through everybody, through, you know, people like us and people like you and da, 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 that you can really read all about it now. So it's not, it's not as much of a, <laughs> you know, scary art. And I think the software has gotten a lot better too at like making IO setups work between sessions. There's been a lot of stuff to help us along, certainly. Steve. Yeah, so um, I'm actually kind of in between right now um, because my main room at Capitol is now under earthquake renovation. <laughs> um, so I'm working out of a couple of places. I still have my, uh, my now famous living room studio, which I'm sitting in now, um, which was set up during COVID and is still set up um, and is being expanded. There's some new speakers on the way and stuff like that while I uh, source out building a new studio for myself. Um, I also work out of Lemon Tree Studios in Highland Park here, which is a pretty big PMC system, which is great. Um, and yeah, I mean, to Jimmy's point, it, it's gotten a lot easier to do. I mean, when we first set up the rooms at Capitol, it was three computers, you know, Dante Network. It was just, it was a nightmare and it went down all the time and we were all figuring out how to do it. And, you know, you, when the smart people don't know how to do it, you know, you're in trouble. Um, so but it's gotten a lot easier. You know, I'm running everything on one computer. I have a Mac mini M1, the new one, and I'm running the whole thing off of that with the Dolby bridge, the render on the same computer. I haven't had any problems. I'm running big, huge sessions. It's, it's so much easier now. Um, and to flip to stereo, I just changed the uh, playback engine, you know, and bang, I'm in stereo. So it's really simple. I mean, I go on a daily basis, I'm switching from Atmos to stereo and back and forth, you know, as, as, as the emails come in, like they all do, can you make, you know, can yeah. you turn the tambourine up a half a DB in the chorus? Like, um, so yeah, it, again, it's, it's really streamlined. Um, you know, the headphone integration is great. You know, I have a little focus, right. That sits right next to me and it's got two headphone outputs. One is set up for Atmos for binaural and one's for stereo. So I just move the jack. <laughs> it's really nice. Simple. Um, so yeah, you know, the control services are getting better. You know, I'm, I can't live without my S1s now. Um, it's amazing how quickly you get stuck on stuff when you have it. Um, and the tools are getting better. You know, we now have better plugins and stuff is being built. Yeah. So we're not having to make it up quite as much anymore, which is nice. Um, it's still daunting. I mean, we're still in the very early stages of this. You know, it's, like I said, I've been doing it for five or six years, but you know, there's only a couple of us that have been doing it that long. Um, so I, I, it's really fun to watch it evolve and, and get easier and all that good stuff. So yeah, I, I can't um, imagine your first two years. And I'm really glad I wasn't a part of that. So. <laughs> it was it was well, because a lot of it was, did I do something wrong? Or did the system break? You know, yeah. and trying that was the first thing to figure out is why how come i can't get sound to come out of these i mean there were plenty of days where literally it took me an hour to get sound to come out of the speakers you know yeah. because something went dead overnight you know one of the computers restarted and not the other one and, you know every time i see a dante screen i get a headache whether i'm you know <laughs> doing it or not so it's you're yeah, not it's enough of a geek i love dante <laughs> you, know, just, you know i understand right. it now but yeah. i don't I try to avoid it as much well, as Well, it's just can. it's just that they call inputs outputs and outputs inputs. Other than that, it makes perfect sense. Right. Well, see, I used to so. tell everybody audio is really easy. There's gaz ins and gaz outs. No. Follow, now it's like yeah. who knows where stuff is going. <laughs> exactly. Um, and what's your uh, what's your setup? I imagine I'm, there's more than one. 
There is in New York and LA. And because Alicia is a little bit hands on with this stuff, especially with her singles. I work at Eric Schilling's facility. He has an incredible facility in Rolling Hills in California. And he has his Atmos and Sony 360 speakers set up in the same room, you know, his 10.1 for Sony and his 714 for Atmos. And we're able to work with George if he has mixes. There's so much, you know, happening at once and we split the mixes up. And it's really exciting to be able to, you know, experiment at the same time, keeping the mixes, you know, somewhat when you're dealing with catalog, we're mixing a certain way. And when we're dealing with new music, we're mixing it a certain way, but we're also trying to experiment and dig into the technology and reimagine, you know, some of the mixes. And it's been, um, yeah, I have, um, I go to Conway and I'll bring portable setups. Sony will come set up in a, in a live room there. We'll time align everything. Same with Atmos. I've been to Blackbird a lot um, with George. So it's a matter of how can we get in? What's, what days can we get in? And I have a setup at my studio in Jungle in New York. It's a little bit of a portable setup that gets set up and broken down, but um, in, the, in, in the process of designing a permanent room, um, I believe the Atmos rooms, you know, in my opinion, can be designed specifically for Atmos, you know, and not my traditional control rooms, you know, at Jungle. So that's where I'm at, you know, I love the technology and I'm excited to see what Waves is doing with their plugins, George is doing, you know, and um, we're evolving, right? We're now seeing mastering. I'm master with Romanowski, my multi-channel files, you know, so trying to get the labels as well to hop on board and understand how this stuff works, so. Excellent. Great. What you got? What do I got? Um, my rig is uh, 714, and uh, I kind of have, I have two different sets of, uh, IOs and I, uh, I do a similar thing to what uh, uh, what Steve does that I switch. Uh, I just switch my uh, playback engine, and I'm using a different uh, different interface that's connected for stereo. If I'm doing an exclusively stereo project, but these days it's kind of um, I, I find things are are morphing now. Where it used to be, do stereo, and Atmos was uh, was a distant afterthought. So it would be do stereo, run a bunch of stems, you know, and if they change their mind, then, you know, bring it, bring, uh, uh, go back and work with the stems and, and make up the, uh, the Atmos mix. But now I'm finding that that's, uh, very early on in the conversation. So I'm starting to find projects that, um, if I'm doing a fresh project, I'm basically going in and I'm mixing it in Atmos, and I'm just taking the derivative mixes at the end. So my stereo mix is actually the, you know, a, a, a folded down version, folded down version of the Atmos project. So it's definitely a, a change that, you know, and it does. It was June twenty second last year. As soon as Apple said spatial audio, boom, everybody, it, everything just changed. Probably within a few weeks. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think we've all talked about the sort of evolution of this where we will mix the Atmos first and then crash it down to stereo. It has not happened for me yet at all. Um, and I think for a lot of people it hasn't. And it's it's really interesting that it has actually happened for you. And are you, how often while you're doing the Atmos mix, are you checking the crash down to stereo because that's going to be that mix? All, all the time. Um, when I'm working, if I'm doing any, say, say that Rush Catalog is a good example, I have the original stereo mix and true to what uh, Jimmy was saying, no stems at all. You know, yeah. I, when I first started to do the uh, catalog reissuing, you know, I got on the, uh, I got on the phone with people that, I, that were involved with the original album. It's like, what did you use? You know, it's like, you know, we mixed it on an SSL 4000B, a B. I said, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, what are we going to do to make that up? But, you know, there was all this, con the concept of taking these, you know, uh, super high bandwidth 24-bit uh, plugins and say, great, let's make these all sound old, Yeah. right? Yeah. But a good, a good sounding old, okay, we, let's go yeah, and do that. Absolutely. Because this would have been before everybody kind of got on the, the vintage plugin wagon, so to speak. And 
in that case, you know, I, I always have the stereo mix running and I'm, I'm going back and forth and I use the fold. I use the fold and I, I get a really good match in stereo first. So really it's not that different. Um, I've had to kind of rethink the way I mix in general because it's pretty difficult to go really heavy on the two bus with processing if you're an Atmos, you know, because the mix changes, you know, if, if, uh, uh, if you happen to be a mixer, that's like really top down heavy mixer, you know, you have your two bus in place and you, you know, you do a fair chunk of processing, you put it out to Atmos, you know, you have a bunch of objects that aren't going to be processed the same way. Uh, the technology hasn't caught up to say, we, you know, we're going to put a plug-in that uh, all the plugins that speak to each other with the objects in the bed, you know, which is kind of ultimately where we have to go, but it's not there yet, right? So all that doesn't really exist right now. So I've had to rethink the way I, I mix, especially for, for stereo. I'm doing less with the two bus and more with more with the single element processing. Right, right. Which is, of course, one of the things you can get around with good stems because they will have been processed and things like that. Um, it's almost it's like the Guitar Hero days, but people are actually going to hear it because there are people matching mixes for that. I know Ryan Hewitt did a lot of that and he loved doing the research to find out what stuff was mixed on, what outboard gear they were using. But can does anybody disagree with me that matching the original mix is that's a job then doing the atmos mix is a job those two things don't actually have anything to do with each other you may need to do both but those are two separate jobs and let me uh let me say it now should be billed separately they're not like oh yeah by the way match this mix a multi-track oh yeah now do the atmos mix i think it's very difficult it's very early days in terms of what people are getting paid for atmos i mean I think exactly. Anne's in a position where it's not the same kind of thing where you just get something in and like how much a song and like well can you turn it around in four days and it's you're actually working with the artist which is another point i want to get to a bit later um, but how does everybody deal? I'm going to jump right in here. How do you deal with a project where you have to match mixes from a multi-track versus something that comes in with stems? Do you get to build differently? Is there anything different in your interaction with the clients when you're dealing with that? Uh, who are you asking? I, anybody. Anybody. For, uh, for, me, it's a, yeah. for me, for me, it's a, it's a backline thing. I don't really think they're ready to deal with all of what you just said right now. Um, I'm more, I'm more un unfortunately or fortunately, I'm like my whole life. I've just been a guy that gets shit done. So like without, <laughs> without getting into it, all that stuff, it's like, I'll get it done. And at some point I will address what you said, but right now I'm just making sure that I can always do that. Cause you're right. These are three different jobs. And, 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 and actually to be specific, <laughs> the, the justice stuff, I did it. And sometimes I can't match it myself. So. <laughs> No, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I can't. Yeah, I, can't I suppose imagine, you're not in as strong a position. Having, huh? You're not in as strong a position to like bill um, for matching your own mixes. <laughs> but, no, but, but I can imagine with even like the Russian with all those drum tracks, I'm thinking, I know the one thing whenever I have to match stuff from people's whatever, as well as drum, you get the wrong set of mics that they use on the thing and you're never going to match it. And how do you know when you're not there? Because I've been there before and it makes all the difference in the world. So there's a lot of tail chasing that goes into all that. So I, I haven't gotten to the point where I can figure out how to how to do what you just said, but as usual, great, Andrew. For, for us, you know, not that I can do it either. And I'm terrible at matching mixes. So actually I shouldn't say that out loud. I'm really good at it. Yeah. I mean, so, for, us, for us, Andrew, like the label asked us because Alicia loves technology, like what would it take? We came up with a number and part we we came up with a number per song and in that was for our assistant to build templates our pre-mix templates of what went to the mixer our stems what came back from mastering the instrumental acapella and the main and the most challenging album was our first album that was done off of two inch tape in 3348 where we had to go match mutes forget match and sonics right like all the mutes that were done on the ssl so even our second album when we had stems with manny he still did automation because it's 2003 we weren't really using 
Pro Tools back then for automation, right? Everyone got in the box from 2009, 2010 onwards. People were still automating on their consoles. So it was my assistant and myself, pre the prep work that went on to even deliver this stuff to George and or Eric to then mix it. We didn't want them coming back going, but the arrangement is wrong, right? Like a guitar is not playing in the proper spot or... So, you know, it was painstaking. And then obviously some things like trying to recall an actual mix, you know, and at Sony, I watched what the legacy department's doing. They're trying to really, on in some instances for some artists, recall, they're trying to get recall notes. <laughs> they have tape machines. They're really trying to, you know, get things as close as possible, but it's impossible almost in some instances, you know? I want to throw out something that Steve actually said in a previous conversation, which is genius for just getting the arrangement right. And tell me if I got this right. You get the, the balance and sound close, and then you mono up your mix and you mono up the original. You put one on the left, one on the right. And then that way, when the tambourine stops on one side, you know you got to go mute it on the other side. <laughs> yeah. So for stuff arrangement stuff, it's side. great. <laughs> yeah. It's That's really, really great. That's awesome. I, yeah. Know, and you someone, do, you do it one just channel seen, at a time. Uh, yeah, and I've just yeah. seen in the chat, which I'm not supposed to be looking at, and someone said, don't forget very speed matching. I've already had to do that on a couple of records where yeah. the stuff just doesn't match. And this is like really good stems, but in mastering, the pitch got changed. Mm -hmm. Right. Or the tempo. I did it yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, one of, the, one of the requirements, and we're jumping into the deep end, so when we get to the questions, I'm sure we'll be filling in some gaps here. But one of the requirements for something that has an existing stereo mix is you have to be exactly the same length because otherwise you get into multiple products and they don't want to do that. So that matching has to be perfect. Like you can't guess at the VSO. You got to go in there, get the number of samples. And it's, it's really painstaking work to get to the point where you can have fun and start mixing. And also what about the yeah. songs like in immersive we have overlaps right i'm sure jimmy you're going through this with justin where there's interludes i had to give eric a block our song as a block of 12 songs because alicia had an interlude that was crossing in from one song into the other where at most you don't you don't in the renderer and everything right you don't and and michael like romanowski we couldn't create the fades the same way and the artist who really are who who want to dive into the stuff or they get harped on their stereo mix and matching everything perfect whereas the id ids and atmos and 360 you know they evolved a little bit now but still it's it's a challenge well it is i mean oh, sorry go ahead jamie no no just so you know that the quality controllers on the other side that was one of the problems because i had a record that had no stops at all from the beginning to the end and they were, they, it made the songs like eight minutes each or whatever. And I was getting notes like, you know, your your length is uh, is like uh, 100 milliseconds off from the actual record. I'm thinking, dudes, come on. It's an eight minute record. What's that? But what <laughs> I realized is in the real time, what, what, what I understand in the real time for where the actual starts and stops are on the initial stereo, they have to match up so that when you go to the Atmos, you think you're doing the exact same numbers yeah i'm just defending them because at first i was like get out of here yeah i mean it's a it's a skew problem it's like you know when you sell 12 versions of the same piece of software it doesn't work so it's the when the because otherwise you would have to choose in advance which format you wanted to listen to and they just want the users to pick an album and then if they're set up to hear atmos great if they're set up for stereo fine and no one has to know and i get that because there's nothing worse than searching for a record you want to listen to and there are 12 versions of it and they all seem to be the same and you don't know what the difference is so that's the reason behind that but you know 100 milliseconds over eight minutes that's wow and flutter i mean like that's just power supply on a tape machine so yeah, that's that's really good fun. I think a lot of people are learning what we had to deal with with tape machines back in the day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and the while nostalgia for don't tape. Like them anymore. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, and I get a lot of how could this happen? And it's like, what do you mean? How could it happen? Like, well, now I have to go and explain how tape works, and that not all tape machines run at the same speed. And you know, where where, where was the mistake? There was no mistake. It just went from this room to that room to that room to that room. It's just how we made records on tape. And yeah, you know, it's why we don't make records on taping. <laughs> At least I, I don't. just finished. 
I, I just finished the project where I was uh, uh, I'm mixing and I'm doing I'm doing the matchup and it's everything's analog, so the mix is drifting from the original because the original mix is analog. The 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 two mixes on analog, so it's drifting and so you know you see the trend where you know if the uh, the tape machine is running slightly out, it's like okay great I'm gonna have to trim and advance everything, and all of a sudden it would get to a chorus. And it would go the other way because I guess they had cut in a different right. take cut the half inch, into the yeah. master, right? So, so, and the tape machine, it's it's a crapshoot, right? Every time you do a pass, it's going to be slightly different. So I would be adapting all of my little nips and tucks to make sure everything would fit. You know, this the song is the same length. And so it's literally like squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Oh, stretch, 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 stretch. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. squeeze. <laughs> so, yeah. And then there was the mixing part, which is completely different yeah one thing yeah. one thing i do now whenever i get an album i do all the prep work first for the entire album like yep. i won't because i can't tell you how many times i've gotten to song seven and gone this isn't the right take or this isn't you know i don't have this is something's wrong and it's like well at least i haven't mixed six of the songs before i figure out we can't do this album <laughs> you know well so, and to that point yeah. when when Ann was talking about the crossfades, that's something that's really, really difficult. You've got to make edit pieces and all that kind of thing. But also the the prep work in terms of figuring out that the length is right, the VSO is right, and things like that. It's If you don't do it up front, the other thing is relative levels between songs. Because Atmos music has to deliver at no higher than minus 18. So basically, I go to minus 18. I'm not at you know 18.1 because I'm going to use everything I can use. But minus 18 should only be the level for the loudest song on the record if you're doing catalog stuff. So I go through and I analyze every single song on the record and the loudest one gets to minus 18. And if there's one that's a DB below that, then that at most mix will go to minus 19. Because mm -hmm. obviously with the dynamic range, it does change the feel a little bit. So the, the level doesn't mean the same thing as when you're smashing stuff louder, but it makes the transitions weird. If everything's at minus 18, you might have something where it just doesn't work the same as a stereo record. So there's a lot of prep that has nothing to do with actually mixing. Yeah, I, what I'll do is on an album, I'll find that loudest song in the stereo and know that, okay, to hit my minus 18, I had to bring that one down 10 dB. Well, exactly. now every single song, I, I'll bring it down 10 dB and I'm as I'm going back and forth, I'm matching my level to that. So my Atmos level and is matching. So it's pretty close when you do that. I mean, you get, yeah. you know, if you know that, okay, I can't bring this stereo down 12 dB to match, you know, because I brought the other one down 10. So it's, it's little stuff like that. That's taken also it's stupid as it sounds. It's taken years to come up with some of that stuff. Yeah. And also like the artists are used to hearing everything. They're two channel mixes that they, printed with compression. Alicia uses Manny and Tony Maserati and Serban and everything is loud as it could be. Things are almost mastered before it goes to mastering. And then you have to, when you're mixing an Atmos, right? Your the gain stage is completely different. So it's getting the artist even, you know, familiar with the, the, the mix and Atmos and separating it, you know, and trying to educate them is important too. Cause right away they're in, you know they think loud you know everything is loud right like we need this to be loud it's not loud enough it doesn't match what the stereo is you know so there's an education process you know yeah i've got a document that goes out that says if you want to check your stereo mixes turn them down by this much and it's exactly and i usually add a half a db or a db just so i sound better but yeah you've got to i mean obviously <laughs> if you listen to a stereo mix that's 10 db louder than the atmos you're going to hate the atmos exactly it's i have never the deliverables work. from sony i work at sony you know i'm part of my job is i'm i'm on staff there and i have a whole deliverables um document that I would love to put in the chat for everyone so they can understand a lot of what we're explaining. If I'm allowed to, let me know if I can copy and paste. Yeah, I would say just email it to Karen. Um, and I'm sure she can stick it in the chat. And while we're doing that, I was going to wait till the beginning of the questions and do this. But let me thank Karen and Ridge for making this actually happen. She's the one that makes us show up. Yep. And uh, the Recording Academy and Maureen Droney for helping put this panel together.
period. She was actually going to moderate till I told her I was going to moderate. And she said, you know what? I'm busy. So <laughs> good call. So awesome. thanks to, to everyone for really helping do this. And thanks to Scott Gershon for getting me involved in the first place. So, all right, we've done that. Let me, let's jump around a little bit because I think that Anne touched on a really interesting point when you expanded out to the entire industry that's doing this. She's really involved working with the artist. The artist is in the room and knows exactly what the possibilities are. Most artists, the first time they hear Atmos is on records that they like in stereo and they're not even necessarily interested in the Atmos. But once you get them in a room and they hear the first time their stuff spread out, a lot of them go, oh, right. And then they're immediately thinking of it for their next record and they're actually starting to produce for ammo. So I think we're still exactly. probably a couple of years before that's a good percentage of the artists, but it seems as though the ones that actually get into a room absolutely love it. The ones who are only checking on headphones, it's not the same, you know, epiphany. Exactly. So what what experience do any of you guys have? I mean, obviously, Anne's got tons of that with having Alicia in the room. But have you, I mean, how did the Rush stuff work out with that? That must have been pretty awesome. Well, let's, uh, speaking uh, to the uh, the mix that you, uh, that you had heard, there's two different versions of uh, Tom Sawyer that are out there. There was the first one that I did uh, for uh, Amazon. Uh, for Amazon's first push into the Atmos market. And then uh, then I did the mix of the entire album and I, I just went back and redid it for sake of continuity. Um, Al had, uh, Al Lifeson had never, you know, he had heard it in 5.1, but he said, listen, just, uh, just get it done in Atmos and I'll come up and listen to it. So went ahead and uh, when I played him the mix, I put him in the sweet spot, stood out of the way, played it for him. And uh, after the song had finished, he was absolutely still for, I mean, it felt like an eternity, probably five, 10 seconds, but he was, he was like, didn't look up, didn't do anything. And I'm just going, you know, he doesn't like it. Right. And he turns around and he sees like, <laughs> and there was this huge space. And he just said, I have never, I've heard that song thousands of times and I have never heard what's in my head come out of speakers. And, you know, he was, he, there was like these huge spots of like, he, he couldn't talk just because of the, the you know, the, uh, the way the sound, the, the, the immersive aspect of, of a song that he would know so well. And when I saw the reaction of that, I've seen, I've seen artists that tear up, I, I did a project for a band called The Tragically Hip and the singer had uh, passed away and the band came to review the mixes and they were teared up saying, oh, it sounds like Gord is actually in the room with us. You know, so if you can extract that kind of emotion from the artist, you know, I, I think that it's everybody's goal in general. It's like, that's what you want to get to the listener, right? If you can extract that from the people that made the song, if they, that's how they can feel about their own music, then I, you know I think it's a really powerful delivery medium, you know, especially through speakers. Headphones is a probably for another yeah. We'll discussion. get to that. We'll we'll get to through that. Through speakers, it's been it's uh, everybody so far that's come in. They're wow, I've never heard this because they there's no masking going on, right? So yeah, you, I mean, and, so and that's been listening. that's been our goal. I mean, music. it's been everybody's goal since we started making records was to make it come out of the speakers in a way that first of all made the artist love it, and then made other people connect to it emotionally. I mean, that's the whole point of doing 100%. what we do. And it's really interesting that you're having more success with this format in making that happen. And I love the idea that I was saying that it's how he was hearing it in his head because I mean we're trained to do it and I hear stuff in stereo in my head all the time but that's not the way as a songwriter you're going to hear it you're going to hear that you live inside the song and to actually be able to do that is pretty awesome yeah it was, I, it was that, that, so, such a strong compliment it's that's awesome I for me what I did which was I played a lot of the Marvin Gaye stuff before I played Alicia her first single right like we mixed our first two singles we started with two singles back in you know, the summer of 2019. 
I, I went to Dolby. They had a pop-up set up in Soho. I took George Massenberg. We went there. And before we played her the mix, we played her Marvin Gaye and a bunch of stuff that she loved because they were they had really great catalog mixes on deck, Dolby. And I sat her in the room and that's the first thing, you know, you can hear the panning, you can hear the people. If you, if you listen to what's going on, you hear the actual people jamming in the room. So I got like, she was blown away by it before I threw her own music at her. I wanted her to understand the format and started to play other people's catalog of songs that she loves and studies. You know, she's a songwriter and producer herself, then played her her own stuff. You know, a lot so. of people do that. And a lot of people do it with Greg Penny's Rocket Man mix. Like, here's right. an intro to Atmos. By the time you get Correct. to the second yeah. chorus, you understand it. But yeah, starting people out on other people's music is really, really smart. Because the last thing you want is them to react to one small thing in their song that they know better exactly. than anything else. Exactly. Yeah, we, so we make, yeah, we make a point of that. that we, we discovered that very quickly that you never play them their stuff first. Um, um, you know, unless they've heard it a million times. Um, the only time I know of where an artist actually rejected an album was because it was not presented to them properly. They walked in and somebody just hit play on their record and it, it freaked them out. And, you know, fortunately that artist came around once, you know, we kind of, to settle them down a bit like whoa, whoa, whoa. but that's the big thing because labels yeah. are throwing this stuff out there without the proper producer and mixer and engineer who even could give input from the original album these labels are just throwing stuff out like john mayer didn't hear his own album one of his albums he had to go and remix it all so there's that element too where the labels just want to pump this stuff out they don't want to give budget to have to bring ken calais in to to mix Fleetwood Mac's rumors, they didn't do that. So like, that's one of my favorite albums sonically that I love, like, how could they not, you know, it's Fleetwood Mac rumors. Why would they not invest in, you know, having someone that, not to say that, but obviously the, you know, in my opinion, you, you bring, and I'm using that as an example, you bring the people, the producer, the engineer, you know, the tracking engineer in that was involved in the sessions, you know, I think that's key. Or at well, least just give them to, the opportunity to say no, that they don't exactly. want to do. I, I've yeah, had plenty just, where I had engineers go, I don't want to do it, but they'll sit next to me. You know. Yeah, so. I think, though, just to give the label side of it, because obviously new formats are the holy grail of people who own catalog, because you sell it in another form. I mean, CDs, amazing, yeah. cassettes, great, even eight tracks. You know, you're reselling the same albums to people over and over. There's no additional income from right. this so the economics of it are very very weird it's something that the labels want they want their catalog in atmos but a stream is a stream is a stream the real difference right now is that because atmos is being pushed by the services that have it there's a lot more exposure because their playlists you just cannot be on because they're atmos playlists so if you don't have it it's not going to happen and i think Unfortunately, that creates situations with artists that are just not into it. I did a Shinedown record and they were really cool about it. But like the way they describe their record is they love 5,000 things pouring out of two speakers. They don't want it split up. Like that's not the point of the record. So getting people on board can be can be tough. But I think, you know, it's definitely worth it because there's something you can do, even if all you do is spread it out so it fills the room instead of coming out of two speakers. It is a different experience. Yeah. And I think there's also, especially when you're talking about catalog stuff, um, something that, you know, me having worked for a record label, um, you know, I would I had arguments sometimes where it was like, you know what, we don't have the resources to do this record. It, we don't have all the parts. We don't just let it go. It's fine. It's in stereo. It's okay. Like, it, you know, I'd rather not do it than do a bad job of it, you know, because yeah. there was stuff that came around, you know, stuff from the late eighties and the nineties where stuff was sampled and, you know, like we just didn't literally did the parts do not exist to, to redo it. It's okay. It doesn't have to be redone, you know, new records. Yeah. Do it in now, you know, cause we have yeah. the ability to do that, but it's, it's a valid thing to say. And I'm not talking about whether you like it or not. Like, you know, I don't want to get into the whole Beatles thing, but that's that's a different thing. I'm talking about we physically don't have the assets to do it. It's OK. Let it go. Don't try to do all this mumbo jumbo to make the stereo work in Atmos. I'd rather, you know, not do it. And I've but said that said, 
you've worked from a bunch of three track masters and mic them into rooms and yeah. like done stuff to make right that. i mean the kind of blue is amazing but that lent itself to that too so you know i, I couldn't do that with maroon five you know be because then i'm just it's just reverb at yeah that point. exactly you know so so yes like a lot of the jazz stuff the blue note stuff you know i do stuff like that and and it's it's the way it was conceptualized in an atmos version with people involved and all that kind of stuff and it and it works for that kind of stuff it doesn't work for everything but people will come to me and go well you did it with miles davis it's like yeah but this is yeah. a totally different record well i mean and all you need to say there work. is you're you're no miles davis well there's that too <laughs> i mean that was the thing it, you know the only thing we could do to that record was break it i mean it's such a good record yeah so uh, to that point that's an example where honestly the the reason i think that record was so powerful is because we went back to the original tapes so it, the CD versions that were out, honestly, are not that good. They've been mastered, remastered, and unmastered. And, you know, so just going back, I mean, when we pushed the faders up, we were like, oh, my God, this record sounds amazing. That's not what we heard when we hit play on the CD 10 minutes before. Right. You know, so just getting the fidelity back from going back to the original tapes was 90% of why that record, why the Atmos sounded so good. You know, and, I mean, then we did what we did, and I think we did it effectively. Um, but you know, yeah, it's, it's kind of blue too. I mean, you know, it, to, to touch on the Beatles thing, like somebody said, you know, oh, I don't like the mixes, blah, blah, blah. It's like, if you're mad listening to Sgt. Pepper, you have bigger problems. <laughs> <laughs> like, you cannot like the mix. That's fine. But you can't be mad listening to Sgt. Pepper. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can be mad doing anything. I've found that out. All right. Yeah, I want to do a, like a quick, quick fire thing that touches a little bit on what we're talking about, but I want everybody to give their opinion and how they deal with it. So we can start with Jimmy. So the difference between, for you, once you got into your speaker setup, the difference between Phantom Center and actually using the center speaker, do you even think about it? Or like, how do you treat that? Um, well, the thing is, um, I say this is my advantage, my disadvantage as well as advantage. I've been doing 5.1 forever. I never ever use that middle speaker. I just never did. I didn't need it. I was always happy. There was a phantom center that used to work in stereo. Why doesn't it work if it goes around the room? Okay, that's just there. I've said it. But um, I don't really, um, because it kind of confuses things. As a matter of fact, you know, in, in, in Atmos, you have the thing where you could turn the actual speaker off, in the, you know, in the picture. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I find with basses and kicks, when I turn that speaker off, they actually punch harder. Um try it maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm duff i don't know but that's what it feels like to me so i kind of go around doing that a lot and putting those things there and of course um the phantom well the center i call the, the center speaker it's not fam at all for for dialogue and vocal you know when i was doing film and stuff i got used to using that specifically for that reason otherwise it was just throwing me off to how i'm used to putting it together so in the music mixes you're just not using the center channel basically i i don't do Not anything much anyway. ever but and yeah generally especially with the 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 the, the, the punchy stuff i find the punch right. is gone. yeah it is an incredibly different sound what about you steve um kind of the same i do use the center speaker i use it more to kind of anchor some stuff for me so but for instance like a vocal or a kick or bass stuff that's traditionally in the center it's probably 80 to 90 percent phantom center and i'll just sneak it in that center channel just to keep it kind of where i want it so as you move around the room it's still coming from the front um and it's and the sub kind of the same like it's just the sub is just an extension of the bottom you know if you turn my sub off the mix shouldn't change all that much it's just your feet you know you don't feel it in your feet but that's you know it, it's they're just there to kind of accentuate the experience right i don't i don't richard? on it richard oh you're muted you're good because you're muting yourself but then it's the unmuting yeah part. no my, my space bar had stopped unmuting so um i end up using uh the for the most part, I use Phantom uh, Center, and I will use some of the mono core elements like uh, uh, vocal, kick, snare, bass. Uh, I put a bit of that 
all of those elements into the center speaker, but not enough that if the center speaker is pulled out, you know, you, you feel the mix do a, there's a slight change, but the mix doesn't fall apart, right? So it's really a, a small percentage where I go from say a vocal, uh, you know, maybe on the slight side, slightly a down vocal mix and, you know, add a, the, uh, uh, the a little bit of the extra supporting structure in, in the, uh, in, in the center speaker. Right. So, and I'm, uh, I also get instructions with artists that are saying, I don't want my voice by itself. So even if I was the type of mixer, I said, well, you know, I'm going to do sort of a classic sort of film style mix and I'm going to throw that lead vocal, you know, high and dry dead center. I, I get artists that say, you know, I don't want to have my pants down in that speaker. So <laughs> don't do, don't do that. I so. will never unsee the image of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. What about you, Ann? I'm with a combination between Richard and Steve. I think Alicia, when she hears her voice in the center, feels like it pushes and pulls, you know, time alignment to these artists too, you know, is important. So I'm the same. I subtly add things in the center, but not enough to make them feel like they stand alone. And then when we go and listen to George and Eric's, you know, mixes together, it's a matter of adjusting that. That's the one thing we adjust. What is hitting the center speaker? And sometimes when, and you know, an, like an instrument or a bass or a kick is too much in the center, it really throws her off. So it's a delicate, uh, it's a delicate balance, but, you know, I'm glad she's a part of it, you know? Yeah, I think I find exactly the same thing. One of the things is that I will almost always be working from stereo stems. So what's great is I can take something that's essentially mono, leave it hard panned, and then in Pro yeah. Tools, there's a divergence control on the panner, which will start to sneak it into the center. And usually, I mean, like going to 90% instead of 100 is enough to make stuff really pop out and get that center speaker thing. Because, I mean, it freaked me out the first time I had a center speaker in my room. Yeah. It sounds nothing like a phantom center. Like yeah, the, the, exactly. the entire song just changes because we're so unused to hearing that. And I think I, when I was doing the post uh, panel, I started thinking like, okay, well, these guys have been working with the center channel for years and years and years. And like, they're not allowed anywhere near it. It's dialogue, you know, right. that's it. And if there's no dialogue, maybe a gunshot, I don't know. But generally the center speaker is avoided in every situation, but, I mean, it, it's good to sneak some stuff in there because I think it sort of makes exactly. the front wall a little more cohesive and gives you a slightly larger sweet spot. But yeah, it just sounds odd to me after sitting in front of speakers for 30 years, not having a center speaker. I also have this weird yeah. thing in my head about there's a channel there, so put something in. like I want to see the meter at least move a little bit so I know right. it's not broken. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I think it's also I've, I've I mean seed mixes that came out of four speakers and I was like wait a minute you didn't do anything here like <laughs> well so I mean Richard and Jimmy both did a lot of five one and Jimmy you said you you avoided it then but there are lots and lots of five one mixes where it's discrete stuff would be in one speaker or another speaker and Richard were you doing five one like that where the center speaker actually got more use no you know the funny thing is uh I I come from the world of trying to make especially in the 5.1 world, to make the mix as bulletproof as possible because uh, you know, with Atmos, we've got the latitude that, you know, you could go from a 714 room to 916 and the system adapts, you know, uh, or, or somebody say, yeah, I listened to your mix, man, and it's on 5.1.2, you know, and the mix adapts. It doesn't fall apart, you know, but if, you know, if we go from a 7.1 uh like a formal seven one system to five one well unless you're you have some fancy dsp trick going on those two extra speakers are getting exactly the, just the thrown audio away. Gets tossed, right it gets tossed because it gets thrown away so that's when i was mixing in five one i always came from that approach that i went you know i want to have this structurally as solid as possible and i would do the so the, the majority of support work is done with the lr and then add in a bit of the C so that in, in the case of somebody that says, you know, yeah, I set up my, uh, the wife let me set up the five one rig and you look at the center speaker and the center speaker is first off, it's only about this big 
you know, and it's sitting in this little <laughs> tiny sound bar, right? It's like, I don't think I'm going to want like a kick, something that's that's like a main element of a mix going through a little tiny speaker this big that's underneath the TV. You know, I wouldn't want my mix to rely on that. Right. Right. Because it's because it will fall apart. And, you know, people aren't going to say, well, my system really wasn't quite right for it. They're just going to say, who mixed this? This is a mess. Right. Where's the kick? Right. Yeah. I remember so that's, back that's in the day on an SSL, you had the subdivisions when you did 5-1, right? There was a big push and they had gotten all their 9,000 patch bays. And then when you looked, nobody realized in the SS, way deep in the SSL menu, there was all these subdivisions that were fixed for center at minus six. So it was, you know, a fixed thing that SSL did that we all learned kind of the hard way, hard way back in the day, you know? Yeah, and those a lot of those pan pots could be switched from left right to LCR, and yeah, and the pan law would change. And exactly, yeah, yeah, awesome. I, look, I want to experiment recording. That's the next thing. I'm gonna, Steve. I'm gonna bring you in. I want to get Alicia in one of the rooms in LA, and let's dig into multi-channel piano recording. Just like George wants to hop in on it to evolve this technology, Andrew. I think the recording process there can be some ways to to start the future of recording so we give the mixers more as a recording engineer as well as a mixer give the mixers more to work with and then yeah. the flip side is the multi-channel plugins i think waves has yeah. a new plugin they just released them george has yeah. one right that's out right so it's i believe it's on its way if anyone yeah, knows any the microphones let me know um i'm ready to dig in you know yeah i mean i think this is where some of the formats that have been around since the 60s are actually really helpful so like the ambisonics microphones which is three <laughs> diaphragms at very specific right. angles allow you to after the fact focus them you can basically right. steer the microphone based on the recording another thing which a really good friend of mine Kamran v um is a big champion of he loves quad but you know right. quad is atmos it's just four channels of it right but an amazing thing because like you can't track through the render the delay through it is too long it can't happen right but just setting up your control room in quad is enough to know that the arrangement is right you got enough guitars you got enough background vocals so right. you know what you're gonna do when you can get to all the rest of the channels and usually it's not that hard to set up most consoles can accommodate it most monitor controllers yep. can accommodate it you can do it with a quad track and a master fader and any pro tools interface like yep. it's easy to monitor in quad and it really lets the musicians get an idea of what to do instead of building this arrangement on two speakers then having to blow it apart and realize like well now everything sounds weak right Thank you so answer, i think man. that's going to be part of it they've Thank been doing it in film that's, that's where it's coming years. up that was that's yeah. been the problem. I've been coming up with trying to do live shit, live stuff. Excuse me. Um, is the fact <laughs> the latency was was insane, so it was it was unusable. So I was having to go after the fact. Just pretend, do your part. Okay, and then we can listen to it back. This is and thank, you. It and <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, Kamran's the one who came up with that, and I just I think it's brilliant. Well, again, the scoring stages have been set up for five one tracking for years. You know. It, yeah. it's you know it's it's already there it's just that we haven't been doing it you know yeah um, exactly but you know yeah. I, when's the last time i could afford a scoring stage like <laughs> it's, yeah it's been like, a while like once a year maybe <laughs> yeah well if you're lucky <laughs> yeah if you're lucky if you're lucky may i um, ask a question andrew yeah of course okay so this is something that's i guess it's for us folks that kind of do this you know how when they have like uh catalog stuff and then they put it out in the future. And basically, if a, if a guy put together a compilation of a record uh, and they'll make him the producer, all he did was put the compilation together. He didn't produce the record. And that's what you see a lot when they you look at uh, Spotify, whatever, that they put this person's name. Even sometimes the, the people that like us that made the records, our names are not there because somebody did a reissue and there's a yeah. new name there. This is going somewhere. That's happened a lot. So, it's happening so, a lot. So, so what happens with the Atmos thing when records that I actually did the original, but somebody else does, you know, so, like you said, they don't have budgets. So the little kids use, do they mix them in their little buds and they're happy with it and everybody's good and they put it out and they get their name on the record. 
or it's just something it was food for no thought. it's it's a really interesting point and to me it's part of this picture of like well if you got to match a mix that's a different job and then you do the atmos mix but now if you buy a new apple device it will default to atmos and if you get your free year of apple music you're going to listen on apple music you're only going to hear atmos mixes if they exist which means the original mixers mix is not necessarily what they hear but to be fair it's based on stems you're matching you know it's based off of that but should there be a credit for immersive mix should there be half a point if the original mixer got a point should you get some sort of royalty not as much because they're the ones that realize the record assuming someone else did the stereo mix but you know where are we going with it and again it's not like anyone's making more money because they exist so i don't think we're going anywhere with it actually but i'd be curious what everyone's thoughts are because i'm sure we've all thought about it i thought on title like when you looked at the credits on title it it said like immersive mixer like, I think there were two right. different credits. It was like Mixer, you know, the, yep. the credits from the original album. And then it said Immersive Mixer. I remember okay. seeing that on title, which I thought was fine. You know, I mean, yeah. I saw my credit and it was like mixed by blah, blah, blah. And then Immersive Mixer, Steve Dental, which was absolutely fine with me. And that's more credits than everywhere else on the internet. Right. But yeah, yeah. and that's a whole nother like, come on, Apple, yeah. you can build this, but you can't put our names on it. Give me a and why can't why can't this smartphone that's so smart automatically know I want to listen to an Atmos mix and switch? Yeah, <laughs> why do I have to go in and switch it? You you know? Yeah, the settings. Yeah, and then anyway, we we don't have to go into that. <laughs> yeah, but I'm curious of thoughts on. I mean, especially as this evolves. I mean, obviously, when you're doing something like what Richard's talking about, you're doing the Atmos mix and that becomes the stereo mix, then that question doesn't really exist anymore. But if you're coming in and just doing Atmos mixes of other people's records, do you have a feeling one way or the other about credits and points and blah, blah, blah? Jump in somebody. I'll take it. Um, you take it. So far, uh, anything that, uh, that I have done mixes to uh where it's catalog work um the mix i i get credited with as what steve was saying that there's the atmos mixer or atmos mixed by and generally speaking in that situation there's also uh the original mix is the two mix right so say uh, using using rush as an example there would be uh, say, uh, uh, produced by Terry Brown, mixed by uh, Paul Northfield for the stereo version, and then I have the Atmos version. And that's kind of the way it is anyway. So, yeah, abso absolutely. I mean, the issue with, uh, issue with points um, versus streaming, you know, with, with streaming, I mean, I'm not sure what the legal battle, whether it's worth the legal battle, you know, unless you have an absolutely immense record, you know, is it worth the, you know, I'll have your yeah, lawyer, I mean, and my lawyer, call your lawyer and we'll get this, you know, put together. Obviously you catalog know? stuff. It's not, you know, you're not going to get yourself a royalty on a Marvin Gaye record. It's just not going to happen. But when it's a new release and it's being split like between two mixers, especially let's say you're doing all of the immersive mixes. I mean, obviously this, entire series is based on the Atmos mixes, but we've mentioned Sony 360. That's all we're going to say about it because I don't want to get in trouble. But, you know, if you're doing two different immersive mixes on something that's also coming out in stereo, it's only ever going to get streamed. I don't know. I mean, I don't even know what I think about it, but it's just an interesting thing as this evolves and it gets from being, I would assume we're, I'd be shocked if we're over 10% of new releases have immersive mixes. But we're going to get to the point where that's a big percentage. Right. I, I think, think it's, that a, has I think to it's be a bigger built. percentage than you think it is. I think it has to be built in the contract. You know, we get the mixer contracts for Alicia to review from all the mixers. I think that if that mixer, they have to build in the immersive and give a half a point and for all the new, you know, new music that's being mixed. Because there's a lot of times when we started doing this Everyone got on deck with Immersive, I feel, once Apple and Dolby partnered, right? But yep. we've been doing this three or four years before that, you know? So eventually that has to be written in the mixer's 
contract, like, you know, and they have management usually like Manny and Serban, either they're going to do the mixes. And if some of them at the time weren't doing immersive mixes, right? Like, but eventually that gets written in, you know, and, and it's their choice, but the label shall should a lot a point to anyone doing the immersive mixers. The credit reads immersive mix, immersive producer, right? Um, especially on the catalog stuff. But on the new stuff, you know, let's say the average album, Jimmy knows there's six or seven producers, right? That work on one album, right? Sometimes these days it's it's tricky, right? So um, I think right now they are crediting the immersive mixer and immersive producer as well as whoever's mixing the stereo me personally i think both should be credited you know even in grammy land both should be credited right like if there's an award i, I get it it's a, an immersive award but we can go into that whole that's another whole ball of wax but i do think it has to um evolve such a new technology that the business side of things has to evolve that's one of the things that has to evolve and also the budget we need mastering engineers, mastering multi-channel, you know, the mixes, like, you know, that's when, that's how it's going to evolve into, you know, you know, artists are going to get more involved. You're going to get more buy-in, you know? Yeah. Wow. And I think the more artists are involved, the easier the mastering question becomes as well, because if you're exactly. doing something that already existed in stereo, that's already mastered, it's difficult to get artist approval unless it sounds like the mastered version, but you can't get it mastered more than once so that they have notes. So it's tricky, but it is definitely evolving. And there are a lot of people doing it. And what's interesting is a lot of them are doing it in completely different ways, just like we all mix in completely different ways. Right. So, and Jimmy, I cut you off. No, no, I didn't say anything, but, but I was going to say that um, in this conversation, I, I, I believe the point thing and all that stuff that like, part of that whole system is the fact that the record didn't happen yet and you're you're saying i'm betting to ride against its success now the records we're doing from catalog they've already been successful so why should the god be doing the atmos make any more i mean it's no a work, no definitely it's, it's a work for hire the way yes. that i right. it's absolutely already proved, it's already you know it's already thriller so uh, <laughs> right. are you doing thriller that's awesome <laughs> no I'm, I'm just saying but so there so, so, yeah um but as Anne's saying, we're talking about for the future, it's, I guess it depends on you and how much you can get, you know, like, like any, any other business we've always been doing, how good are you getting money from these people? Um, <laughs> and yeah. that, that hasn't changed and how much margin and all the above, and we'll see what that turns out to be. Um, I, yeah, no, I think it's, I, you know, the, the future holds a lot here. And it's, yeah. Yeah, and as, as, you, as you're saying, when the artists are listening, uh, with the artists being supportive of it and so forth, but there's really the money isn't getting any bigger. And as you no. know, there's like, there's no, like which is what makes the, makes the half a point thing actually appealing. Like, look, if you want to pay a third or less of what the stereo mix budget was, then help us out. Oh. Okay. You know, but anyway, yeah, no, that's, it's, that's so, and Steve, just to go back to, yeah. you know, you were saying it might be a larger percentage. I'm including all the indie releases because like the Orchard, which handles thousands of indie labels, only started accepting immersive mixes. It's less than six months ago. Right. So you yeah, couldn't no, get them it's out. It's very recent, but like I know Universal was saying something like they wanted 90% of their new releases. Yeah, the major label stuff. Released in absolutely. Both. Yeah. Yeah. The three big ones are really, really pushing it, right. which is great. Um, yeah. Just to, for the last thing um i think also we're because we're so in the, the young stages of this whole thing right now we have people who do atmos and people who don't do atmos and people are into it and people are not into it you know if this evolves the way i hope it does and it should it's kind of be a non-issue because if you're mixing a record you're going to be set up to do atmos to you know at a certain point if you want to be in the game you're going to have to be able to do this you know i, I think it will involve evolve into that you know, kind of like in the old days when, you know, I used to sit and, you know, Al and I would have conversations and it was like, yeah, yeah, we would do mono and then it would be stereo over there. It was a whole different thing. And eventually they came together and, you know, it became, you know, one person doing both. So hopefully this will evolve into that too, where this situation will go away. There won't be special. Yeah, guys. but I do think, you know, we haven't really talked about sort of the cost of getting into this. I mean, you can find some speakers where you're like, you know, those aren't too expensive until you price 11 of them plus a subwoofer. Yeah. And 714, I mean, that 
it has to be the minimum. If you're going to say, I've got an Atmos room, you can't do it in 512. Like you need four above you. And I think seven is kind of the minimum. Mm -hmm. and, so, you need, and you need speakers. You need speakers. You need yeah. a monitor controller. It's, you can't there's a lot that goes into it. You can't do it in, it in headphones alone. I hate to break it to people, but you no, just I think you know there there are people who can you can learn to start it in headphones, and that mm -hmm. can actually be really useful if you're trying to do stuff that has existing stereo mixes to make sure you're not breaking it immediately. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I do. It um, but but yeah, but you've got to get in front of some speakers. Now let's let's go to the listening and headphones thing. So this is going to be another going around the circle thing. What formats do you check your Atmos mix in that do not involve, well, they can involve speakers, but are consumer listening environments. And this is like, I be truthful, like every single mix, where do you check it on the consumer side? And if you don't, that's totally cool. But like, what do you set up for? How do you do it? Um, I'll start. Richard's looking at the ceiling, so he gets to go first. <laughs> okay. I get to go first. No, I'm not actually. I'm looking at speakers. Uh, okay. I've got, uh, I, because I'm, I'm just looking at the, I've got a set of, uh, geez, I don't know what they are. They're little, they're not oratones, they're kind of oratone copies. So as far as consumer uh, speakers, it is is my that's my main thing for consumer vibe when I'm uh, in stereo here. Um I mean, I have my set, I have sets of speakers. I have Genelex and these ancient KRK E8s that I've been carrying around for decades. And I, I know what they sound like. So those are kind of my, my go-tos with the, the Genelex for the, uh, uh, for immersive. As far as headphones, I have, I mean, I have the Apples, I have Sennheisers, I have Bayer headphones, and I, I jump between them all to listen to the, the binary mix and and you know I, I part of the discussion i think we we have to touch on is you know getting that binary mix and the speaker mix you know what are we doing to get them as close as possible because it is it's a mission and a half to to do that you know and I, so i just bounce between like multiple listening sources uh to average everything out so to speak so but you're you're going between the uh the atmos on the speakers and the dolby binaural into multiple different headphones okay. yes cool jimmy exactly i i'm i'm doing uh basically speakers and then i do the i have the apple guys i, I hit that bullet and um and i go through the binaural through the headphones and I have, a, I have a whole bunch of other headphones too, but I just choose not to, they, they all sound so different that it just confuses me. It reminds me of the car thing. I have this thing about cars, which I'm going to change because we're here in the future and people will be listening to Atmos in their car. So it's okay. But my thing always with mixing was always been like, don't go to your car and tell me to come back and mix my mix to fit your car. I'm sorry. So that's kind of why I don't go to all the different headphones because it makes me crazy. And I don't, I, I just, I pick one and I stick with it. And I work it until eventually that's my medium. I, I, and you know. so again, the Dolby binaural out of the renderer. Right, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Steve? Um, yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm on speakers. Uh, I always check the binaural. You know, I have that sitting next to me. I have in the past, I have a Sonos system in my back room that I can take stuff to. I'll listen to the Apple. You know, I, I mean, I think I kind of listened to it a lot more when it first came out but now I kind of have a pretty good handle on what stuff is doing in different places. So, you know, it's, it's pretty much just the speakers and then the headphones and so depending on the mix and what I'm doing and my mood, sometimes I'll start in headphones and then, you know, maybe it depends on what time of day it is or night it is <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to be quiet. What your wife has to say about it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, what's going on is the gardener here, um, stuff like that. So, um, but I'm usually just the speakers and the, and the binaural mix. Um, you know, the Apple thing is, is a bit of more of a crapshoot um, because of how they do their thing, but you do have to pay attention to it. Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll get to something in a second yeah. after Ann uh, goes here. So I use the Sennheiser uh, soundbar um, that uh, Eric had at his space that Alicia loved, and we set one up in our space. 
I um I'll use the Amazon device unlocked just to hear what the consumers are hearing because when you when it's unlocked you can they do like 10 dB of there's things they do in the 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 Amazon device you know you have to pay attention to so I'll listen um um in Apple headphones just to hear how the consumers are hearing things right like what are the the consumers are the most important you know, people to be listening to this stuff and how are they consuming this stuff? So I try to go to the devices that they have, Sennheiser headphones, you know, the, the new Apple Air Airbuds, um, the Amazon device, you know, um, Tidal, you, you have to, and I'm pushing the DSPs to allow us to preview this stuff. Amazon allowed us last time under a fake name just to hear what, you know, just what's going to gonna happen what's going to happen right i think that's critical so yeah that's that's how i'm the sennheiser bar is pretty amazing i was pretty blown away by it but not every consumer could afford it you know when my thing is when is the what's going to be successful to bridge the gap between what we do and how the consumer exactly hears. and i think that's a big thing is that the the people who manufacture stuff that people listen on are starting to embrace Atmos, but it's always their top of the line stuff. And there needs to be lower budget things for people to listen on. And there are things like, I mean, the the Alexa, the Amazon um, studio, and then also uh, the home pods and things. They're so clever with tweeters firing all over the place. They sample the acoustic yeah. space they're in. So you yeah. can simulate stuff. I mean, look, taking your phone, if you're listening to an Atmos mix with your phone this way, you're missing out. Go like that. You would swear there's speakers over here and over here. Right. Like it's insane. Yeah. It's not Atmos in terms of an immersive stuff behind you, stuff above you thing, but it is a spatial experience. And just um, to hey, Andrew, something before, super- Before we go off of good, that, yeah, topic. yeah. I think it's important to remember that the binaural and the smart speakers and all that stuff is the playback systems are evolving. Yes. The, your mix is not evolving. No, so no. The speaker the, mix the, is still your master. So exactly. As, the the as ADM evolves. <laughs> the right. ADM yeah. is the master. Everything else is made from it. Um, I went through a lot of the technical stuff last week, but there are probably some people have used MP4 been here, right? so. for our sound bar. Right. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, but it, being, it's the binaural you hear on Apple on your phone today might be totally different in six months. Exactly. As the every yeah. every iOS update may or may not change the encoding. So the the point is, just like when MP3 encoders came out and they sounded like I'm going to use the word ass because they sounded like ass. They were horrendous, but they kept getting better and better and better, and you just make it from the wave file. So there's always a master and everything else is made from that. And in this case, it's the ADM. It's the full bandwidth multi-track file with the pan metadata. That's your master. So you want to check on headphones to see where things are at. And I just wanted to mention that with uh, Logic, whatever version, I can't remember exactly, uh, 1073, I think it is, um, you can monitor an input and hear Dolby binaural, Apple Spatial without head tracking. And if you've got the iPods Pro or Max, Apple Spatial with head tracking in real time, you can switch between the three. And what's been really useful for me with that is that normally I've got the uh, the binaural going into my headphones, which are my Sony's that I've just been using for years. But then when you would switch, get the MP4, put it on your phone, listen to that, you're on different headphones. So to be able to hear all three formats on the same pair of headphones is really useful. And it takes no CPU, just open up Logic on the same computer, yep. build yourself a little template. And all you have to do is take the 714 re-render, route it in. And then in real time, you can just switch over to those headphones anytime you want. So it's relatively new. So I think it's worth mentioning because it used to be to hear the Apple stuff was such a pain that I have a feeling as mixers, we all stopped checking it as much as we should have. And now it's easy. 100% because it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, things that are a pain don't go well with us. <laughs> no, not at all. All right, um, I'm looking down the list of, of stuff um, that people would, oh, well, okay, let's talk about this in terms of your speaker setup. So. 
one of the things we talked about last uh, panel, which is really important, is the time alignment of the speakers. With two speakers, it's pretty easy to figure out where the sweet spot is. With Atmos, there's basically a very reduced sweet spot because as soon as you move, you're not dealing with the delay between two speakers, you're dealing with the delay between 14 speakers. But one thing that was really interesting before we get into like how you deal with that in your room was a few of the the guys who build facilities for mixing theatrical Atmos were saying that they will timeline everything and try and get as big a sweet spot as possible because you know you've got three mixers and you've got the producers and the directors and there are a million people that all want to be in the right spot but then also what they were talking about is you very carefully measure the delay to every single speaker then take your tops and your rears and just add 10 milliseconds and I thought, well, that seems insane. But if, you, if you've if you time aligned, so the differences in the individual speakers is taken care of, I just did this yesterday. It is so much easier to hear what's actually happening in the room. It's crazy. It just makes it like it's a bigger room. But of course, you would have time aligned. It's a bit of a, a thing in my brain to figure out why I like it. But it's amazing because I think as stereo mixers, you can speak to this. I mean, maybe it's just me. I have a really hard time hearing the rear speakers, even when I roll back and I'm right next to them. My brain just goes, boom. It's all coming from the left and the right. And that's it. Until you like pinpoint something really loud in another speaker, my brain refuses to hear it. And it's why we're actually really bad judges of the headphone mixes, because people who listen critically for a living can't externalize anything. It just doesn't happen. So for me, having that extra delay, all of a sudden I can hear all my speakers, which was kind of insane, but it, it's coming from the post guys. So it must be good, right? Are you time aligning with a DSP? Like what are your speakers have like the GLM kits? Like what are you using? Well, I've got the SPQ in the matrix because okay, I'm, cool. I'm running the render on a separate computer. So got with it. the SPQ, I've got that got built in, but then I added... And what's good about that is I've got all the really tweaky time alignment going on in the matrix and it remembers that. And then in the renderer, I just pop 10 milliseconds on. So I didn't have to remember what the old numbers were. And it's it's awesome. Maybe it's bad, but it actually sounds great. But Steve, you just took a bunch of speakers home and set up. How much like setup mm -hmm. did you do? Because you've done so much Atmos before. Could you do it by yeah. feel or did you really need to align well, it? I mean, I I aligned it as much as I, you know, because when I did it, it was COVID. It was serious lockdown. I was, wasn't, nobody was coming over, <laughs> you know. So yeah. I did a lot of, you know, uh, laser measuring with my Home Depot laser, you know. I mean, I, I got the speakers as close as I possibly could. I, you know, I had a reference microphone. I shoved pink noise through it. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I did the best I could with the tools I had at the time. Um, you know, when we tune the rooms at Capitol in those places, it takes all day for those guys to get in there and do it. It's a big process. Um, since then, I've done stuff like, um, you know, now uh, Sonarworks came out with their multi-channel thing, which gives you, you know, depending on the system you're playing back from, you know, I'm on, I'm just using the renderer. And unfortunately, the delay in the render is in, you know, milliseconds, which is a waste of time, kind of. I mean, a millisecond, nobody's speakers are 50 feet behind them. Um, so that needs to change and get down to like quarter milliseconds probably. But um, so, yeah, I mean, as it evolves, it's, it's, you know, there are tools to do it. I will say that even though, yes, I'm in my, my living room here, I still have access to real rooms. Um, I can still go to a real room. Nothing, I mean, I shouldn't say that now, but it, for the first couple of years, nothing I was mixing at home got released until I heard it in a real room. And I definitely made changes in those rooms. Now, I've because I've been sitting in this room for a few years now, I'm pretty, I've got a, a handle on it. I know what it's doing, um, but I still like to listen in real rooms. Um, so yeah, you can do it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and again, at the time I did it, I had already been mixing for a couple of years, you know, two or three years in Atmos. I was really, you know, I had a lot of my techniques were, had evolved to that point where I knew, okay, I just played this, you know, well, first of all, I had reference material. I had stuff I had mixed that I could listen to here, which helps. And then 
I could, you know, I knew, okay, this has always worked. It may sound a little weird in the living room, but I know it's going to work. So, you know, I wasn't fighting that kind of stuff. Luckily I had had that kind of experience, you know, to where I could, I could kind of trust, trust my technique as much as I, as much as I couldn't trust my speakers, I could trust my technique, right? Not the speakers, but the room, obviously. Well, um, let's, that touches on a kind of an interesting point, you know, talking about real rooms and things, but obviously there's going to be like, we're super lucky. We get to work on artists. People have, most people have heard of, they have some sort of budget. We can get into rooms. We've been successful enough. We can set up the rooms that we want to mix in. For years in stereo, the sort of investment level you needed to make records has been going down and down and down. And I think in a really good way, there are people making records on laptops that sound ridiculous. They're amazing. And now all of a sudden we've gotten back to this barrier for entry for the people coming up. Now they've got Logic has it built in, Cubase has it built in, Pro Tools is built in-ish. So it's it's kind of an interesting time where there are some tools that are readily available, but past headphones, all of a sudden, like you need to know what you're doing to set up the room. And I don't know how I feel about it, but I'm curious what you guys think. Jump in. Hasn't it always been, hasn't it always been important that the room is set up so that we know what it sounds like, right? Yeah, it's but with been, two speakers, right? it's pretty easy to take a rectangular bedroom and like put some egg cartons on. The, like you could make any room work in right. stereo sure. or work in headphones. And but you know, as Steve says, I mean, I can get a lot done in headphones because I'm used to it. But you can't finish it. You need to get it on speakers. I'm just curious. Do you is do you like the fact that it sort of puts it back in the world of people who? kind of know what they're doing or do you hope that it trickles back down the way stereo mixing has in the last 15 years i think but i i don't think it will i don't think it will because there's the technical during the mix process there has to be a there has to be a technical standard because if our speakers are out of whack we're going to make mistakes we're building on a on a crooked structure Right. So the way I think going from, say, from JBL to PMC to Genelec, all three companies uh, achieve the same end with completely different means in a lot of ways. Right. So, you know, I mean, the Genelec system is is it is pretty crazy intuitive as far as, you know, if somebody puts up speakers it's kind of they technically they have to be close ish to the specs. You know the the, the right. specs with, that that I get in the manual. It's like, wow, you like you can put them this close to the wall, and that's okay. I I was shocked, and it's like no no software adapts. And when I do when I would do a, a read of my room, which is set up, you know I I did the whole laser. It's funny you mentioned. I was sitting with the laser and the protractor, getting all the angles correct, and uh, but, you know I think that there has to be that standard in place and th the costs are going to come down. There's, there's companies now that are coming out. I think IK just came out with uh, like a high res version of their iLouds. I think it is, you know, and I haven't used them yet, but you know, I've heard some people like they're pretty smoking and it's, it's not like they're uh, you know, buying, buying like a, a good honking pair of ATCs or PMCs up. You, you probably get in a whole Atmos rig uh, of IKs that'll at least put, you know, indie artists in the ballpark. Right. And and I think one thing that came out during the post panel as well is like they are now having to mix, not having any idea how stuff's going to be played back. Whereas that has been the entire history of the record industry. Like that's it. Yeah. We've always just been about how does it translate, not how does it sound in here? It doesn't really matter what it sounds like in your room. Right. It just matters what it sounds like when it gets out into the world. So I've just been informed we're actually at question time. That's like the fastest 90 minutes of my life. That was pretty good. <laughs> um, so instead of me asking questions, we're going to let other people ask questions. So I'm just going to read them and then we'll answer them. How's that sound? Oh, this is a question for Steve only. No one else is allowed to talk. Uh, this is from Alex Solano. Uh, with software companies releasing 712 plugins, EQs, compressors, limiters, effects, do you find yourself routing instruments and vocals from the object bed to the 712 bed? Thanks. Yeah, I'm 
figured that was going to start coming when the little video was released <laughs> last week. <laughs> um, I have not changed the way I'm mixing. Um, I think when, um, I mean, this is, you know, we're talking about the new waves, the waves compressor that I, that I did a video for that I, I like, I've been using it for a while. I stand behind everything I said in the videos, um, because I do use some busing. So it is effective for me, but I have to this point, not really changed the way that I'm mixing. Um, I still have my object bed and all that kind of stuff. When, when pro tools catches up a little bit and I can do more than a seven, one, two track in pro tools, I will probably use more of those kind of tools. Um, but no, I still mix with lots of objects, um, going through my object bed, you know, and the object bed, it does not have everything in it. It's just got the stuff, you know, a few things in it. Um, so yeah, it hasn't really changed the way I mix. Um, again, luckily for me, I was never a mixer who leaned on my stereo bus processing. You know, it was always just to get a little bit of level. Um, you know, I always joke, I, nobody ever taught me how to use an EQ. <laughs> the guy I sat next to never used them. So, you know, I mean, I was kind of taught, like, just keep mixing till it's right. You know, you mix with faders, not with compressors. So for me, it hasn't been that big of a problem. I have ways around doing it. Um, but as the technology moves forward, I'm sure that all my stuff is going to change. It, it, it's changed already in the last yeah. five years. So Yeah, I think all of us have evolved much yeah. faster in this format than we did totally. in stereo even yeah and you know but but yeah my my basic you know the basic template that you know i think most people are still using um it's fun i love going to these parties and people are playing back atmos mixes and i can look at the render and go he has my template he has my template he has my template <laughs> <laughs> or a form of it which is great it's not it's not um, yeah but so i think to answer the question yes i like the tools yes i'm using the tools but my basic approach to mixing in atmos has not changed all that much but there hasn't been enough time. So we'll, we'll check back and, with you and as well. And the tools are evolving. I mean, I see people in the chat talking about, you know, that the goal, the holy grail bus compressor that we're all looking for that applies to all the objects and that kind of stuff. It's really hard to do. I mean, yeah, I've there are, there are a couple companies, companies there are a couple companies that have put out things that do it, but the timing, it's exactly. impossible at the moment. At There's the, no at, infrastructure for plugins to talk to each other on exactly. a sample level. Yeah, I it think just, you and I have been talking happen. to the same the same people about yeah. it. Yeah, and each time and... you hit play, it's going to be slightly different. So, yeah, you need to, and I think we've all done the thing where you build a mix bus in objects, and then some stuff goes there so you can process, and some stuff yeah. doesn't. And But it's right. just like the mixing and stereo thing, where some stuff, it's really important what it sounds like, and other stuff, find a level and move on with your life. Yeah, like, it exactly. doesn't really matter. Yeah. Okay, so, well, that but, was only one question. It oh, will evolve, and it will get better. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're building the tools that we're asking for. And sometimes it doesn't turn out the way you want it. Like I'm finding I like using multiple versions of stereo reverbs set differently to build a surround reverb than I do a lot of the surround reverbs. They don't, yeah. I don't hear it as being surroundy enough. Mm -hmm. All right, anyway, next question, uh, which I can just answer as we do it. Um, to, is there any difference between Dolby Render built in? or using separate render, Logic Pro, for example, do you hear any difference? I will answer that. The answer is absolutely not. You can't just say, I'm gonna put an Atmos render in. If it's Atmos, it is Dolby approved and it is bit for bit exactly the same as running the render. So if you're doing anything that is Dolby Atmos, it doesn't matter what the software is, it's gonna be the same. Now, that said, there are a million different binaural encoders and things like that. But if it is Dolby, it's Dolby, it's Dolby. So you don't have to worry about it. Your files will be bit for bit the same, or they wouldn't be allowed to release it. There you go. Um, okay, we actually talked about this already. Do we check your Atmos mixes in Logic Pro's Apple Render? I do, because now it's really easy. Um, so recently began to import the ADM into Logic. Yeah, so you can import the ADM into Logic, or you can just stream 714 in. It is exactly the same thing. The Apple process is take the ADM, make a 714 out of it, then spatialize it. So making it 714 is an intermediate step. So you can let the Dolby renderer do it, or you can let Logic do it when you bring in the ADM. But now you can monitor in real time, so you don't need to. And as far as I know, and this is just like with the MP3 encoders, 
Logic will sound exactly the same as Apple Music. That's the deal. Like with the MP3 encoders, when they updated the MP3 encoder, encoder for the iTunes store, the Mac OS got updated as well. So it was always identical. And they're pretty careful about that. Now, you know, maybe it gets out of sync sometimes, but yes, it doesn't matter where you listen, which is good because otherwise we'd all be screwed. We'd never know what we were hearing. Uh, okay. What plugins are you using in your Atmos mix? Are there any tips you can share? Uh, what are you using to keep the mix at minus 18? Uh, as I keep going over the current mix, I'm using Logic Pro and I'm a disabled musician, producer, filmmaker. Um, thanks for the talk. Well, first of all, you're very welcome. And who would like to speak to some plugins that you found really useful in Atmos that you didn't necessarily use in stereo? Anything? I think cinematic rooms <laughs> you know some of the reverb plugins are getting really good um those were the first ones that we had you got you anything know. jimmy i'm kind of using the same stuff i was using there you go richard anything spectacular okay so for monitoring levels somebody mentioned monitoring levels um i'm either using isotope uh insight 2 or nugen to keep uh, things at minus 18 i take a uh, 5.1 re-render and feed it back to a uh to yeah. dummy ox track and pro tools which probably is what everyone's doing uh so that's what i do for levels um as far as atmos specific plugins um I have found, you know, there's a couple of uh, some of the older uh, stereo reverbs because, the, again, because the catalog work, you know, where if I'm taking something like a 480 and I want to make a, uh, I want to make an Atmos version of, uh, of, you know, like wooden stage or buck ram or something from the 480, you know, I will end up taking uh, four instances of, uh, of a 480 plug-in and uh, just work on them to get that get that width but maintain the same character as what the original uh 480 is i mean i have you know c like cinematic rooms uh reverberate three and all of those uh all those uh, uh units i mean it, it would be the same if i want to achieve the same thing uh using the existing technology you know I just use multiple versions and adjust them to get that spread. But as far as anything else, I mean, you know, I end up using a lot of the things that I would use in stereo or available up to 712 for the bed. You know, if I want to add, do a yeah. bit of limiting or anything like that, or EQ across the bed, you know, and then I, I apply everything else with objects. I, I'm still doing them all individual and just using a whole honking amount of plugins to right. if i want to do anything like put a you know if i'm doing something that that might be on netflix i've got my next netflix safety limiters across everything but that's uh, that's kind of the extent of it it's not that right. different there's anything where i go wow this is this is an atmos holy grail for me and anything in particular i'm using the same plugins i would use in stereo um especially because with the catalog stuff and really trying to recreate some of the same feel and sound. So I'm using multiple instances, you know, of the same plugins. Hope to experiment a lot more as obviously Waves just came out and, you know, the George stuff and check a lot of that stuff out. But I'm waiting for a compressor, right? Multi-channel. Yeah. Well, uh, the Waves one... The Waze one's pretty cool, and it is the only one at the moment. Uh, yeah. Fab Filters Limiter is a true multi-channel limiter. I got two quick ones, which are awesome. Uh, one is Nugent Halo Upmix, because oh, it yeah. will unwrap stuff. And there are two things about it that are amazing. One is it's it does it in a way that it will crash back down to stereo perfectly. It is exactly the same signal when it comes back to stereo. So that's good. You're not, like, messing up the stereo version of your Atmos mix by blowing something out to 712 that was only stereo. The other thing that I've used it for, which is awesome, is you get a stereo stem of vocal with effects, but you want to spread the effects around the room or get the vocal right. a little dry or whatever. You can use Halo Up Mix and then turn off left, center, right, and sides and just have top and rear of what it wants to spit out. It's nothing but effects. 
and it will take Nugent just Halo? the effects and spread them. Halo Upmix, yeah, from Halo Nugent. Upmix. Okay, got and it. And the other one, uh, which Alan Meyerson turned me on to a long time ago when I was just doing a 5-1 mix, is Spanner from Cargo Cult. It's a true multi-input surround panner. It's ridiculous what you can do with that thing. It's awesome. So I'd highly recommend those two. All right, we've got to blast through these. Um, do you guys edit the trim and down mix controls in the Dolby Atmos render? It was in the guideline from a label and I've tried both uh, leaving them automatic and manual, putting them at zero as the guideline said, but I'm also not sure which one to use. How do you guys use it? I have never once tweaked those, but Steve's got his hand up. So yes, um, I do tweak them. Um, I set mine to zero. Um, because I think the way I mix, uh, because I use the space fairly aggressively, I don't, as it folds down, I don't want it to crash down. Two things about the trim and up mix controls, they do not stay with the render. So every time you open the render, you have to open that up and reset them. Um, Dolby knows about this. We've been bitching about it for years. I'm sure it will get fixed at some point. The other thing is it will affect the loudness meters coming out of the renderer because the loudness meter is basically, you know, it's doing, a, it's, it's looking at the five one re-render. That's how they do the level. So like the way we found it is we would mix in one room and, you know, it would meter at one level and then we bring the mix to another room and it would, it's like, wait, how come it was minus 18.2 upstairs and now it's 17.5 or whatever. Those controls will affect your level reading on the meters and what they're looking at ultimately whoever the they are that we deliver this stuff to is that level coming out of the renderer so yeah so another it, it, great it is important at least to know about another great metering plugin by the way is decibel awesome and you can completely customize it or pop it on an ipad or whatever it's a it's a really great one uh and i've found i tried all of them on the same mix and they're all within 0.1 db of each other so they're all fine. But again, as Richard said, you feed them a 5-1. You don't feed them the entire thing. So as you're saying, Steve, obviously your down mix controls will affect what that 5-1 is. Um, I think also, when you talk, not a plugin, but a piece of software is the Dolby Album Assembler, which yep. if you're doing whole records, can be a godsend. Does That's not nice. uh, does not crossfade yet. Does not, not crossfade yet. yet, but it does do some limiting, and it it's yeah, any Q. It's not the end all and be all. I'm not. It it's not, but it's a really good handy tool to have to get yourself out of some problems. Yeah, and for just for the people who don't um, haven't worked with it a lot, one of the reasons that crossfading is so difficult is because of the headphone metadata. The binaural metadata lets you set distances, but you can't crossfade between an ADM that has object 15 set to far and one that has it set to near it's impossible so that's where it comes we have not talked about that metadata i don't think we should because it's such a rabbit hole we'll leave that for now um someone's asking is anyone considering head tracking during their mix um yes i have logic open so i can switch to it uh because it's how a lot of people are going to hear it again the speaker mix is the master but you got to check what people are listening to. Um, as the technology progresses and becomes more integrated in DAWs with lower latency, with the renderer perhaps, do you feel excited about the prospect of an Atmos first workflow rather than traditional stereo first, uh, which in some ways is a hang up from movies in their opinion, um, i.e. the artists writing, recording and mixing in the format from the beginning. I mean, I think we've already sort of covered that talking about even just tracking in quad to give yourself a way to do it. The latency, I mean, it's digital stuff. So there's only so low the latency can go, to be honest. If you're working at a certain sample rate, it, it's tough. You're not gonna be building headphone mixes out of the output of the render anytime soon, I don't think. But in terms of mixing, I mean, Richard's saying he's already been able to transition to Atmos first. So I don't know if anyone has any more to say about that, or do we move on to the next one? We've already and I don't, I don't think the latency of the render is an issue that Dolby's too concerned with. So. No, no, because it's not meant to be a real-time recording thing, but there are, there are ways around it. There are ways around it. Um, I mean, just the fact that all of the DAWs have multi-channel tracks, so you can pan stuff, you can do whatever you want already. It's more about the monitoring setup than the software, I think. Uh, 
There has been a lot of talk about how things sound on speakers, but the reality remains that it's still largely a headphone-only format for the consumer. Are you concerned at all with the lack of speaker playback options that are accessible to the average listener? I am deeply concerned. I think there are some, like these soundbars we've been talking about. You can do a 5-1 Sono setup really easily, but to get overhead speakers involved, the amps involved are very expensive, the Marantz, the SPD, and they're awesome. But you're talking about having something that's got both, it's got HDMI to get it in from an Apple TV, it has an Atmos decoder, and then it can get it out to speakers. And that's a lot of technology. So I'm curious if you guys have specific thoughts about what you're hoping exists for consumers. Um, I, I think, doesn't Klipsch have a system that has uh, angled high frequency drivers that it's designed for a uh, more or less like the typical dry, like the drywall box of a, of a living room to reflect off the ceiling and back down to listener without having to put speakers in. I think it's right. Klipsch that has that, right? And um, you know, when I just over the course of the last while, you know, like I could go into a Costco and I've seen Samsung, you know, have a special booth set up for, and it's an Atmos booth for their sound bar system. I didn't have a chance to listen to it, but just the fact that you would go into a Costco and say, you know, I need 14 pounds of apples and an Atmos rig, you know, that those, th those are starting to be, uh, you know, common everyday things. I see it in Best Buy all the time, especially around Christmas. Yeah. There's loads of stuff. I think Sennheiser's got, they've had a rig in there that's set yeah. up. I, again, Samsung has got a, a rig that I've seen set up in there. So, uh, you know, I think that what we're working with right now, keeping the quality of work really high so it is a great uh a great access, great experience for the consumer is really where, where it starts. And, you know, the manufacturers, if the man, manufacturer sees a demand, everybody scrambles. They, they will scramble for it when they see the, the demand. You know, if we, if we were having this panel four years ago, everybody would say that we're a bunch of nuts, yeah. you know, mixing in a room full of speakers. It's like, no one's going to do that. Who's going to listen to that? You know, and now there's stuff that, you know, uh, uh, we had a thing come in. It was a, a little bit Amazon. I can't remember what it was called. It was about yay big. It was this little tiny unit that just sat on the table. And I mean, it didn't sound, uh, it didn't sound exactly like the Atmos mix, but the experience was consistent. You know, it, yeah. you felt height, it felt dimensionality to it, you know? And I think that if, uh, you know, the faster manufacturers can get this type of, uh, uh, listening item out to the uh, monitoring out to the uh, people, the better it's going to be for everybody, including us. And I, I think the only two things to add is that, and they're, they're very much tied together. One is that people are scrambling to get the word Atmos on their equipment. So they're licensing, they've got the chip inside, but it doesn't mean they sound good. And that's a problem. And then I believe it's Samsung, interestingly, but it may be another one, one of the major uh, television manufacturers doesn't want to pay the license fee because it's really expensive. I mean, if they're churning out 50,000 TVs a week in one market, they're paying that license fee 50,000 times. And there's been all this talk of Google building open source codecs for this stuff. So it's probably going to get a little bit messy. But I think the one thing about Dolby doing it is what we were talking about with the renders. If Dolby says it's, the render is working, the render is working. You don't ever have to question it. If Dolby says the decoding on the device is correct, it's correct. Now, what speakers they put it through, who knows? But at least there's a baseline knowing that stuff exists. But I'm really hoping things like that Sennheiser soundbar you're talking about, I mean, it fires tweeters all over the place. And it's great. They're really fun yeah. to listen to. Yeah. And I think we have to give these, some of these consumer companies a chance. You know, yeah. I mean, this is one of the first time. I mean, I mixed for two years before anybody could hear this. I mean, it wasn't even being, there was no way to release it. Now, in hindsight, we knew there were deals in place, but, you know, people are like, when's it going to be in cars? Well, it's coming in cars, a car, you know, we've, yeah. I've been in the meetings with the car manufacturers. It takes them five to seven years to design a car. You can't just put speakers in, you know? So if, if they say today, like, yeah, we should put Atmos in this car, it's going to be five years before that car comes out. <laughs> so yeah. I think we need to give them a chance to catch up a little bit too. Yeah, it is. You know? it's yeah. It's still high new. end stuff right now, but it's really new. So 
you know, and the nice part about it is like with Amazon, when they were developing that Amazon studio, we already had mixes that we knew were going to be played on that. We brought the developers in and went, your little speaker is cute. Can it play this? And I hit (laughs) the button in studio C and they were like, oh shit. Okay. That's what you're going to be playing. And we were like, yeah, they're like, okay, great. So at least they knew what we were after. And I think it's the first time that, you know, the cart hasn't been before the horse, you know, the con we have the content. Now you figure out how to play it back rather than here's our cool speaker system. What are you guys going to do with it? Uh, The next one is that uh, Anne just mentioned recording with spatial mixing in mind. I think we've, we've touched on that a few times, Um, but this is specific about miking. So does anyone in the panel find themselves using spatial close miking? So MSXY, et cetera, versus ambisonic or tetrahedral microphones used at a distance. I use mid side and X, Y and stereo. So I'm a big fan of it, right? Um, I want to experiment with more microphones and you know, your idea today was incredible to have to mix, to have four speakers in quad so you can sort of play with the panning of what you're recording. But I think that's you know what I want to experiment with and learn about the new microphones that are out there that you know are are being developed. You know, I think um, that's my next phase of diving in and would love to bring everyone on this panel in, you know, and just you know, um, bring Alicia in because she loves to experiment. But I definitely work in those formats, even in stereo. And sometimes I made a piano plugin with native instruments. Um, You know, it's 14 or 15 years ago now. It's called Alicia's Keys, but we mic the piano from the composer, behind her ears, from the composer's perspective. Underneath, we had several different microphones and different spaces and places for the tone just to put them up obviously we only use two in the end but it's interesting to dive into you know and i think another thing to keep in mind um and now and myerson actually talked about this you can get excited and start putting microphones where the speakers are going to be but that's not actually that useful because then the listening position has nothing to do with what you're recording what alan found is one extra stereo pair of mics somewhere you wouldn't expect it just gives you enough that you can fill up the entire room you don't need 14 mics with them where the speakers are um they did a great thing at uh at blackbird actually where they (laughs) put a band into George's Atmos room and put a microphone right in front of each speaker and recorded the band playing. And it sounds amazing if you listen in that room and it's a disaster everywhere else. So don't think about your microphones as future speakers. They're not. It's just gather perspectives that can then be moved around. I think that's a lot more useful. Then you have tracks and options, right? and the ability yeah. to perfect it as on the recording side of things. So then you can play with a lot of those additional files that you have and see where you can place them, you know? I, yeah. I had a, I did a, I've told the story before, but I did a big band record where I recorded it and I was like, I'm gonna record this for Atmos. And I took all these extra mics and I put them, hung them all, you know? And I went to listen to the first playback and just check the mic. I wasn't listening in Atmos or the stereo, just to check the mics, make sure they weren't distorted or everything and realized I had this fantastic recording of the ceiling at Capitol. And it, it, sounded, it, was, it was unusable, really. I mean, I left a couple of them up there. You know, I took all the mics, brought them back down to like ear level. And suddenly I had stuff to your point, not, I mean, my thought process was put them where the speakers are, but I ended up not using them that way. So yeah, it's just, you know, you want some ambience, but you don't want a ton of ambience then you just you just need you need raw material just like you do when you're mixing a stereo record right you want a room mic on a guitar you figure out what to do with it later right so you can put one up there and then the two closer ones back here you're just creating space it doesn't have to be big huge space and another thing just to go back to the plug-in thing one of the things that i love and i was doing in stereo as well is to use multi-mono reverbs because then the pan pinpoints where the reverb is in the room so you can decide to have it follow or to have it be opposite and it's it's an amazing thing especially if you build like a multi-mono spring to be able to say piano's there reverb's there now the reverb's going to move but not the piano like you can get in great spatial stuff that's impossible with a multi-channel reverb so don't throw away the tools you're using just learn new ways to use them i'd say we're never going to get through all these questions are we 
Um, <laughs> do we know exactly how DD plus jock is feeding the Apple codec? Okay, I do, but okay, here's the really, really quick answer. It's just like making the 714 re-render and going into logic, except DD plus jock is a streamable version of the seven. It's not really 714. It's a streamable version of the ADM. And it combines objects and it groups things together that it think it can do. It's basically an MP3 codec that or AAC codec that understands what Atmos is. So it has lower bit rate for the top speakers. Like there's a lot to it, but it's basically how the hell do we stream files that are three gigabytes for a two minute song? That's what DD plus jock is. So the way it feeds the Apple thing is eventually it becomes 714, gets spatialized. Done. Next. <laughs> uh, when Are working you done on talking, the news... I zoned out there for a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's all right. I have spent so Jock much sounds time. Sounds like something I need a shot for. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll have a drinking game. Whenever I say something boring, you drink. <laughs> You'll be wasted in minutes. Um, I think this is probably a similar question, but I haven't read the whole thing. So when working on a new song that's been mixed in immersive, because of all the spatial separation allowed in Atmos, has the approach of using reverbs changed a lot? And or when working from stems, when these stems have reverb printed in them, is there a specific challenge when doing the speaker positioning in Atmos? Anyone? I try to print my stems dry. I give the mixer as I'm a recording engineer. And, I'll take and, that. Um, and, yeah, go ahead. For, uh, if I have the, um, I, I worked on a project for Universal a uh, short while ago and the producer said, he's like, I, I don't know how to do Atmos, hand it off. And uh, I got asked for a request for, what do I want for stems? And I said, everything dry. If you have effects that you want, give me a separate rendering of the effects. So that's the optimum situation where I could take that and I can listen to the effect and I have the option of either uh, making it immersive or I could make a an, uh, similar, so something very similar to it in Atmos using, using the plugins that I have. So I'll either do an upmix to what they, what, th what they give me or I'll, uh, or, or I'll uh, uh, regenerate it. Um, I find that, uh, that it's more challenging to, if there's something that's stereo and I, I, it has reverbs printed in it, then it starts to be, well, I'm gonna try and up mix this if it's something that I hear in immersive, uh, depending on, on what it is, right? If it's something that's a, a mono, if it's a mono element with a stereo reverb, you know, I might try going with, one channel of it and then see if I could spread it. Right. It really, it's, it's really a case by case, but definitely the more, the more things that are baked into the stereo stems, uh, it, the more, the more work it is to, to spread it out. Richard, do you ever go back to your raw file or your pre-mix file where you can have the ability to, you know, mute a lot 100%. of that? If I, if, if I have the, if I have the resource available, I absolutely would default to, as much stuff that is uh, as untouched as possible. Right. And generally, if, I, if I'm reaching out to somebody, if I have the if I have the luxury of reaching out to somebody about it, you know, I'll just say, "Well, give me your example," and they give it to me in bits. So I, I kind of know what their vision is, and then I can build an immersive version of what their vision is. I find that which the is, most, is the way yeah, I build my template. Yeah, yeah, is kind of that so you have the option of both right you have the stem yeah. you could go back to the original raw file you know yeah yeah so we're technically at time but i'm just going to keep reading the questions till karen says we have to shut up if anyone's got to run totally cool but um i mean i'm already drunk so i'm not going to get any work done <laughs> i'm not really um, someone's asking a question about Hornet Samp, which is one of the uh, multi-channel linked master compressor limiter EQs. I, the concept is amazing. At the moment, the timing has issues with all the people trying to do it. And someone's going to figure something out, and that's going to be amazing, but I'm not using any of those. I don't think anyone here is at the moment. No. Okay. Uh, 
uh okay interesting so basically has anyone mixed anything for the metaverse does anyone put on goggles and spend time in the metaverse no all right i'm just going to skip it because it's an interesting thing because it goes to the head tracking but that's more like game audio where it's being mixed by the game in real time as you play and I think the metaverse mixing will probably be more like that, where it's not going to be a mix. It's going to be an endless number of stems that get mixed within the engine. And that'll be cool until they screw something up and then you won't like it. Uh, someone says Pro, Pro Tools or Logic Pro X. It's whatever you like working in, you should work in. End of story. Logic, you don't need a separate render at all. Pro Tools, you do at the moment, but you can bounce your ADMs offline not in real time and those are acceptable i have found there was one record that i delivered and they kept saying this one song was a bad adm and i was bouncing it out of the pro tools and then i went and bounced it in the render and they said oh yeah this one works and i said well okay you've got a bug then because they're the same thing and they actually did find a bug in their ingest system so dolby is dolby is dolby it doesn't matter what DAW, it doesn't matter how you set it up with a render on the same machine separate machine whatever so on we go uh mixing in logic pro on both music and film projects use adobe render and adobe atmos bridge as i found some bugs in the logic version of the render okay if it's different there are bugs but that's not a question that's a statement but thanks sam um so if there are bugs then they're bugs but if it's different it's because there's a bug uh what monitor controllers do you guys use that should be quick so what do you use for turning up and down a million speakers at once? I have a focus right system. I have a Coleman audio box that was kind of made for that specific purpose. Genelec. And what do you use? I have Genelec. All right, I'm using, it's all Dante. So I'm using uh, the Dad Mom, which is the best product name ever, uh, monitor controller. And then I'm a geek, so I've written some software to do some stuff too. But yeah, I find I need a knob. I, I can't be reaching into Pro Tools and grabbing a master fader. Yeah. It's just yeah. too much work and you, you'll option click it at one point and blow your own head off. So you're using uh, Batman in Pro Tools, that software that opens up the matrix? Yeah. Yeah, Dad, yeah gotcha. Yeah, Dadman, it's interesting software. We'll leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> but when it's working, it's, I mean, once you get it set up, it's awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Dante is one of the coolest things ever, I think. If, uh, you, know to, if you know how to use it. <laughs> yeah. So how many years do you all think it'll take to make Atmos the new standard for mixing? All right, let's just get a number. And Five. Steve. Five to seven, yeah. Jimmy. Five. Richard. Five. I'm a sheep, so I'm saying five. All right. Uh <laughs> I got nothing else. Um, do you have any personal favorite reference Atmos tracks you like to listen to before mixing? That's a really good question. Steve, because you've got access to more than anybody, I have a feeling. Oh, I used to. Yeah. Um <laughs> <laughs> back in the day. Uh, yeah. No, um, not 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 for me personally. Like, well, forget uh, about the reference thing. Just what Atmos yeah. mixes have you heard, or even if you've done them, that you're like, man, this is awesome. This has really worked out. Um, you know, other that, than Kind of Blue, because I'm going to say that one. Yeah, well, uh, I do like that one too. That's for listening. Um, I do like the is it the Tessio song, the Boom that that one of that uh that Pete Gonzalez did. That's amazing. Um, the record I've been that actually I did and I like it quite a bit is the Cynthia Revo record, um, which I, she made that record. And as she told me when she heard the first mix, I didn't realize I made a record for Atmos because it just, nice. the, the parts were just there. And she was like, oh my God, this is the record that this is the way it should have sounded. I didn't know we could even do it. So she had so much fun doing it. I just think it's a really fun record, so. Excellent. All right, quick fire, Jimmy. What do you like in Atmos? I I was listening to um, Imagine Dragons uh, Believer. <clears throat> that that particular mix is pretty interesting. Oh, it's just... Is that a Manny mix? I believe uh, it's Nick, Nick Reeves. All right. 
but I don't know if the Atmos one is. And there lies my question again. Ah. No, yeah, Nick did it at Capital. Nice. Richard? You know, I enjoy Stephen Wilson's work. He's doing some really great stuff these days, you know? So yeah. he's uh, he's got that magic touch going on. So I appreciate a lot of his uh, his work. And Yeah, he's you know. working on every record from my childhood, basically. <laughs> He's working right? through the Crimson yeah. Catalog, like everything. Yeah. yeah, I know. It's pretty crazy, huh? Yeah. Pretty crazy. And anything in particular? I like the Marvin Gaye stuff. If I heard a, recently a current song, uh, some of Ariana Grande stuff was done at Berry Hill in uh, Nashville. And Show Me Love, who was mixed, by, was mixed by George. It's one of our singles me and George worked on together. Really experimented and reimagined and panned and we you know so we listened to that we spent a lot of time on that so there was an interesting thing right when apple launched they had uh zane Lowe do like the hey what is this thing and he did a bunch of them and i think it was what's going on that they started with the mono mix and they went to the stereo yeah. mix and they went to the atmos mix and all i could think was god that mono mix is amazing <laughs> <laughs> Which is the opposite of answering that question, but I'm going to move on because I can do whatever that the hell I want. That is the mix that I, I first heard when I heard, one of the first mixes I heard that. And of course, at one of Elton John's. Yeah. Uh, was it Benny Yeah, Greg Penny. Or, yeah. Greg is awesome. And he's so into it. Like he's been chasing this forever, starting yeah. with 5-1 and then moving. And he just, there's nobody more excited about it, I think, than him. He's still excited about it. And he's really, really good. Um... Okay, uh, we're never going to get through them all, but I'll just go in order. So the mixes I've done in Atmos have all been done from stereo mix stems, but if it goes the way of mixers doing both stereo and Atmos, would you choose to mix from the printed stereo stems or start from the mix multi-track? I think we've already covered that, basically. I don't mind doing it from the stems because I'm terrible at matching mixes. I think that a lot of you guys would rather work from the multi-track, but I, I just worry. I, it really terrifies me. Depends on the record. Yeah, but I will say the most fun I've had is when I get to do stereo and the atmos, where I'm not yeah. chasing, where I'm not chasing somebody else's tail. Yeah, yeah and I've I've tried to explode my stereo to atmos and had terrible luck and just printed stems. But I'm I'm looking forward to when I feel confident enough to actually go to atmos first. But also, it's the approval process. You need a record where they're going to approve that way. Because the last thing you want to do is do an atmos mix and then be doing five million tweaks to the stereo version, which is all they're listening to. Right. And you have to, you know, you have to have the mastered version to match the lengths and all. So there is a bit of a, you know, a bit of a circle that you get into there. Right. Um, here's a question which I can just answer and you guys can tell me if, you know, you disagree with any of it. Someone's asking, should they send the client the binaural re-render or the MP4, whatever? I send all three files. I send them the ADM in case they can get into a studio. I send the binaural and I send the MP4 and I have a two-page document Page one, how the hell do I listen to this stuff? Or actually page one is why are we doing this in the first place? And page two is how can I listen to these three files? And it's it's a lot. You have to explain it in that kind of detail. And I think having it written down is the only way you'll even get close to people listening the way they need to, to actually approve stuff. But I will send all three. Cool, Same. all good. Yeah, just send all three. No reason not to. Uh, does top-down mixing work more or less in Atmos, considering how beds and objects work? Does the strategy for mixing change dramatically or not? I'm not even clear on what top-down mixing is, but someone else already said was, it tonight. Yeah, I was wondering too what they're what they mean by that. Who was it who said top, it? Was it Richard or Jimmy? Top, yes, me. Top-down is essentially you get your uh, your two bus processing set up and you mix into it, right? Oh yeah, that's so, me. You know, it, right. So it but. It really is, it becomes less relevant the less that you do in the two bus. And that's kind of uh, that's kind of the way Atmos is reconditioning me that I'm doing less on my two bus and more on the individual tracks. Really, it depends on mixer style, right? So there's a lot of yeah. people that, you know, they'll do very, they'll do a not a whole lot to each individual channel and then do a lot of work on the two bus. And then there's a lot of people that'll do the work on the individual channel and maybe just you know, I've got a limiter that just sort of, grab, you know, shaves off the peaks at the very end or, or whatever it is, right? So the more you're in that position, the uh, 
uh, less of a shock the transition is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and technically it's difficult to work. I mean, I've built object beds and things like that, and I got a bunch of them, and yeah. Uh, but I'm going to keep going here. I usually have the stereo mix key, a series of compressors on my bed and objects. Do any of you have any thoughts on issues with this approach? There are no issues, really. I've just found it really weird to be pumping something that's on its own moving around. And I really buy the approach of I build my front wall like it's a mix and everybody else gets to be ear candy and doesn't need to be controlled. That's kind of the way I approach it. Mm -hmm. Anything different? Yeah. No, I mean, if I have, I'll do the the side chain compressor thing if I'm if I'm chasing a mix that was heavily bus processed. You don't right. really have to do that kind of stuff, but, um, and I'm still using the Andrew Chef's plugin. <laughs> because <laughs> it sounds so, good and it's got a side chain input <laughs> so, so scott gershon who's the one who put all this together is asking how do you handle ceiling height speakers and i would say very carefully because you're on a ladder um <laughs> but, you I, but um, I use them a lot i love it i use spanner and things like that to come up over the top i will helicopter stuff up there i've got an auto panner that's just waiting to be used up there in quad um, but they are extra speakers. I would never put anything important up there by itself because first of all, in a room, uh, the listener most likely has terrible top speakers if they have any. And I think that that crash down can be the weirdest when they don't have any height speakers. So personally, they're kind of effect speakers and I love them, but I wouldn't rely on them. Anything I'm just, different? I'm saying, I always like to have stuff going there so that when I do put something up there for effect, it's not like, oh my God, there's speakers above me. You know, I, I want, so I always have some, probably more than more than you think going on up there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, and I think part heavily, of it, but it's, it's not important stuff. And part of it is that humans have not evolved to be able to locate stuff above. Because unless you think that we are around at the same time as pterodactyls, in which case we have a bigger conversation to have, we don't get attacked from above. So we just, we don't localize above. There's no point. We're pretty good at the side. So we know which way to run and even behind us. But yeah, so above, I mean, I like spreading stuff. So it starts getting into the top, but yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, what are some of your favorite creative techniques for Atmos that you haven't used in stereo? I think we've kind of covered a lot of that. So I'm gonna gonna move on from that. Sorry. Uh, in which situations do you use an up mixer plugin like Halo from Nugent Audio? Anyone else want to speak to that one? I use it for orchestra a lot. If, if I get a stereo uh, project I'm working on right now, I've got a bunch of uh, stereo orchestration that's come in and uh, no possible, there's, there's nothing else. I have a stereo track and it does a remarkable job of yeah. uh, spreading, the, spreading the orchestra out, you know? I used it on a hand claps track on the last Atmos mix I did, and it was awesome. It it did exactly what I was hoping it would do. You're just surrounded by hand claps. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it worked great. Uh, okay, uh, as a music mixer, are you mixing an Atmos with an SPL meter? Uh, not an SPL meter, no. I don't because I think with a there's some music mixers who are really good at at level like Chad Blake has a set level for his speakers so he knows where he is. I've never been like that and Jimmy just had had enough. <laughs> um, does anyone here keep their SPLs in a particular spot while they're mixing? No, but I very rarely change the level when I'm mixing. I have one running the uh, GLM. Uh... Uh, software has got a small window that's in the corner of the monitor and I just sort of keep an eye on it to make sure I don't start to do uh, SPL creep as the night goes on. But I, right. you know, I'll, I'll sit somewhere around like 80, 82 ish DB and try and stay there. Even if yeah, it kills I think we me, all I'll probably stay. have like our favorite spots and we kind of physically know where the knob goes, but I would have yeah. no idea what it is. Yeah. Um, there's another question about sending out binaural renders versus MP4s and is one better than the other? And they are different and they are both important. You need to send both because it's listening to the two, not competing, but the two very, very different experiences that consumers will run into. 
great discussion today. What are topics for the upcoming webinars? Um, I did say at the beginning, but the next two are basically for Theatrical Atmos. One is the actual mixing for Theatrical Atmos, and the next one is sound design for Theatrical Atmos. And then webinar five is basically a wrap up of all of it. So all things Atmos. Uh, for Richard, how are you doing your stereo down mix in Pro Tools or from the render? I think you said you're just using the stereo re-render, right? Well, yeah, I'm for projects where I am, it's a fresh project, then I have, if Atmos is definitely on the table, then I will do my best effort to go from Atmos and take the re-render uh, stereo mix out. Uh, but I still have a formal separate stereo system that's hooked up with a, uh, you know, I still have a bit of a hybrid system that's going on if there's something that I'm doing that's just stereo. Right. So, but if you're doing both, it's the re-render. You just make sure you monitor it where you would. Yes, um, a lot. Yeah. There is a certain Maureen Droney. Uh, she's typed some stuff about how great we all are, but it's not a question. So I'm not even going to read it. <laughs> Hi, Maureen. And thanks, thanks for saying that we're great because that's nice to hear. Um, so talking about uh, talking about now just a few streaming apps or streaming Atmos, the device problem and the non the non-difference about the ADM and the binaural render. What do you think about just release songs at binaural named by Dolby Binaural Remaster? I've released a song at Wave Binaural and what I hear Spotify sounds like the same as the ADM file in binaural. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but I think like we've been saying, the ADM is your master and you create binaurals from it. And Dolby can change the algorithm anytime to make it better as far as they're concerned. Apple can change their spatial thing anytime they want. The one thing that will never change is the ADM. So even if you're only listening on headphones, that's your master. Right? Okay. Uh, Andrew? Yes, Karen. Is I that think, it? We're done? I think we're done. So if you could wrap it up, please. Okay. Um, that's it. We're done. <laughs> Karen says we're done. I want to thank everybody. Uh, Jimmy, who, uh, what did he say? I don't know. Jimmy says, Jimmy says some stuff too, because he's gone. But thank you so much to the amazing panel. I want to thank Eatma for putting this thing together. And the, the uh, links to their site, is, I think Karen just put them in. Um, definitely go to EATMA. It's a conglomerate of all of these different organizations that do mentoring for people coming up. Um, and you should absolutely check them out. And remember, give money. Because if there ain't no money, the lights go off. And then we can't do webinars. So that's it. So now we all very awkwardly are going to turn our cameras and microphones off. And everybody else is going to go have a beer. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks for everybody. having me. Enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right.